only to see it's it's so funny in this part of the book because obviously we're just there's like all that horrific death before but then immediately the next scene is they're like getting into transports to be like you know we need to get to the next high city and they look to their right i think and then in the little forest bit there there's one orc who's like waving at them and it's like and then they shoot it eventually and it's yarrick realizing that this gas call had realized what was going to happen he'd pre-planned like basically what was going to happen in this he knew it was a trap essentially i feel a bit sorry about that orc though it's just like oh gaz was like gub the gormless i'm gonna send you to stand by the forest and just be like you're useless like you he's like oh i got a special mission that's pretty cool Does i'm going gun go, I'm just going to go <laughs> yeah Wait, fun. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Lore Crimes. Today we will be talking about Commissar Yerik, Old Bailey, the scariest commissar to ever exist and perhaps the coolest one in most of our opinions, I think. Maybe he's not around anymore, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, but before we get started, we have to cover the question of the week. Now, what the question of the week we had for you all was hashtag insistent on a fistin. Uh, <laughs> who would you most like to punch? I regret uh, nothing. <laughs> in forty k, or well, Warhammer in general. Pardon me. Uh, I said for Imperial or not Imperial. Oh my lord! I am. I, I'm a <laughs> crimson <laughs> fists. Who would you like to punch them? That was a so diet. We blood raven did, didn't we? <laughs> we did blood raven it. Oh no. Uh, but uh, yeah, insisting on a fist in. So uh, the first one is from uh, at S T N I V N O one. Uh, Steniven01 uh, <laughs> hashtag insist not a fist in the head of Ferris Man. No, <laughs> just oh. imagine slapping that head and spinning <laughs> it on your finger like a basketball. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my beloved. Uh, Iron Hands Bros can't stop losing. Oh, my gosh. Just kick us it's, while we're down. Right over it's meant to be the most like haunting part of the book is when Ferris's head gets like slapped on the ground in front of Horus. Even Horus goes, Ugh. like that, that's a bit <laughs> gross and he starts talking to it and basically turns it into a does he turn into a cup was that at um, some point i think that's game I of think... thrones but he definitely talks to it i think he just has it like because there is like an artwork where he has the skull above his throne and there's bits mm. where he apparently looks at it and goes Ugh. but i know game of thrones is when they they killed joe or mormon the guys i think it's raw oh just yeah just that was out of it yeah. god that was that's pretty was... Heavy. There's this really like somber art piece of Fulgrim holding Ferris's head, and he looks down really one, sad. Yeah. Except the problem is, I almost never see it unedited. I only ever see it with Fer Ferris or Fulgrim holding the Doge. <laughs> the Doge, <laughs> and then the I've caption is, "I love you, funny yellow dog." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I know it's that. like, "I love you, funny orange <laughs> cat." <It's> like, <laughs> I've never seen that unedited. Yeah, I had to oh, look it up. Doge. My poor, Doge is like my eighteen years old. Is it? Dad? Kabuso's she still had, going. Yeah, she's, she's still, still up. She's still up. James is dead. That's yeah, sad. Yeah, feels bad. Oh, real. God, my I poor mean, Ferris man is I'm dirty. sure an edit of that picture as well, where it's Fulgrim with like, uh, you know, those McDonald's fries like holders, and he's got a couple of fries, and he's just there going, <laughs> looking sad. <laughs> I love you, carbohydrates. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next one is uh, another name I'm gonna have trouble with. I'll be real. Uh, Ag Nasrame Sor Sakram 719. Uh, feel free to something. look in the general and uh, <laughs> fact check me on that pronunciation. Uh, hashtag insist not a fist. And this is a good one. I like this one. Uh, I'd mash my knuckles into the paper mache consistency bowl of the Emperor's actively rotting noggin. <laughs> oh. Finally knocking him past that last inch away from death so we can see more definitive change in the Imperium. Other than Gilliman's back and he's changing politics and policies, what exactly? You know, stuff. <laughs> this is a smart yeah. man. I like this man's ideas. Oh, nice. Get some actual Me change too. going. So this is some Xenos propaganda. Absolute, uh, absolute disgusting. 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 Good. Good. 
can't believe you said that. Oh. Uh, the next one is from Zach M five four eight five. Uh, hashtag insistent on a fistin. It's a uh, Marathi because she, and then it's a break. I've realized I misread uh. the question. Uh. <laughs> My man. <laughs> Uh, to be honest, I saw you oh. posted something along that line on your Twitter recently, Colin. <laughs> oh my gosh! And I just, I just put a, an image of the tick going neat, and that was it. <laughs> uh, the exact thing I tweeted for ladies and gentlemen was, uh, "If I was Malekith, I would too, bro." <laughs> oh. oh my gosh! God, I could take the whole, you would. take the whole podcast you would out. I <laughs> mm. can't even blame Dude. him. This is bro, the you are down bad for perhaps the. <laughs> The worst human, <laughs> the worst person who's ever lived. I world. don't care. <laughs> She's like female Erebus, bro. <laughs> hey, she, <laughs> she bad in the game, and she sure looked bad too. Sheesh. <laughs> oh, moving Damn. on. Uh, the last, or well, I've got two more, but they're both variations of the same thing. Is uh, Sunships Lover four zero five seven. First of all, nice, Sunships are delicious. Nice Good man. Good man. Uh, insisting on a fistin, I would punch Gotrick Gurnison because I too seek a mighty doom. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the next one is the Lucky Goblin 5880. I'd punch Gotrick with my non dominant hand just to say I could, and then I'd hastily scribble a will down with the other. <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to oh, be man. quick. You'd have to be very I mean, quick. You'd have to be like touch typing with a quill, like. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be even worse if he was drinking too because it, would, it, it wouldn't he would well to be fair, you'd be long be enough over. just to get that that dead. one eye just to stare at you like like he'd be scribble. actively looking for a fight <laughs> I feel like they just scribble I leave all my belongings to Gotrick Gurnison hashtag sorry <laughs> don't kill my family please please <laughs> <laughs> swear don't put it in the grudges not grudge please <laughs> Gotrick doesn't have grudges he grudges it don't live long the, enough to be a grudge. The book is Grudges clear. Required, there's going to be a bit of time where you can't meet out some punishment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love how like oh. every time you had to, you kind of pause before you said insisting on a fist, and as in like your skin crawled every time you had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so awful. Oh man, but um, we will be talking about uh, something a bit more um, ancient and old, and doesn't really know how to give up. Uh, well known for not retiring. Uh, Yarrick, so the question of the week this week is what would you retire from Warhammer? Hashtag retirement. Yes, we are operating. Hashtag retirement. So be careful what you get linked Don't to. Don't say law crimes. That's rude. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For example, I would say retire the entire Space Marine model line because I think it'd be funny. Dang. Oh, <laughs> just to see what people would do. Sad. I don't know. I feel Bruh. like you could say, by the same token, you could say, I could retire the entire Eldari line because no one would notice. <laughs> Boom! Oh. Gotcha. Oh. They notice right gotcha. now because they're top of the win rate, baby. Jeez. Eldar got nerfed from best to best. Fucking <laughs> Eldar. <laughs> I think I have a good answer, which is uh, I'd retire Marnius Calgar. Because goddamn, oh. that dude deserves or <laughs> deserves More than to go. Dante, really? I was saying, get him out. Dante's whole thing is like he's not gonna go. Like that's he's he's the one who outlives everyone. Calgar kind of just, it's he's fine. He's had his time. It's he's fine. Well, I, he's I did start, put him in the bin. I did start listening to Devastation of Bar, and they were like, Dante doesn't look like even old space means because he's got like saggy jowls, and it's like, oh, oh. Looks at, it's like, oh, poor Dante. Now you're taking a piss out of his saggy cheeks. Oh, <laughs> poor guy. I would <laughs> retire Abaddon to the spoiler so that uh, Huron Blackheart could take his place. <laughs> That's a good answer, to be fair. Although, probably, uh, Ed from the Sam Man of Terror will probably have the company's already going to knock on your <laughs> yeah, door and start yeah, fighting anyone who <laughs> <laughs> believes in that. Um, that's a good, it's a very good channel. People should go uh, check that out. Um, with that being said, though, we'll head on to the beginner section. And uh, that was the question of the week. I'm going to pass it to Andy for the beginner section. On uh, the Thanks. one, the only Commissar Yarrick. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one, boys. Um, we all love Yarrick. I, I've not met anyone who says they think Yarrick's rubbish or he's, oh, that, that guy's boring. He's an old man. Old men are boring. Ugh. <laughs> Yuck. Ugh, put him in an old folks home. Rubbish. No. We all love Yarrick. Yarrick's good fun. Um, now, I will preface that Hal is a bit of a Yarrick fanboy, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Somewhat, yeah. We've both converted into one. Yeah, I mean, we've both done a Yarrick video on our channels. Mine's a measly 15 minutes. 
howls as a girthy several three hour, hour endeavor three yeah. hours long <laughs> yeah and yarricks over the yeah. setting howl's video is longer than mine so i think Silence. he's the one <laughs> silencing all conversation in the locker room exactly. when he brings up his yarrick video yeah just like flumps on the table anyway um but the so the, the I'll, I'll give you guys an overview for the beginner section but it will be fairly brief so keep that in mind but just know we're gonna get into it and how's going to you're in good hands when how gets to the expert but to start things off, uh, Sebastian Yarrick is known as the hero of Hades Hive, the bane of the Greenskins, and a veteran of two wars to conquer the world known as Armageddon. Uh, this man was originally, when he was a child, raised by an Astra Militarum soldier who was retired, which you, you, is very rare. The only two people I know who were raised by fathers who retired from the Astra Militarum are Yarrick and Gabriel Angelos from the Blood Ravens. Like, very rare for anyone to retire from the Astra Militarum, but Yarrick's grandfather did. Um, so Yarrick would learn uh, some skills of survival and combat from his grandfather, which would uh, prove to be very useful when his homeworld was invaded by Greenskins and they started slaughtering everyone. But during the invasion, Yarrick, as a younger man, he managed to evade the orcs. He laid traps. He, he killed a few here and there. And... After a few, I think it was months of survival, the Astra Militarum would retake the homeworld he was born on, and finding him an orphan, his grandfather, I'm, I'm sorry to say, passed away or was butchered by the orcs during this time. Yarrick would be inducted into the, the, the school for gifted kids of the Imperium, not Hogwarts, it's called the Scola Progenium. Uh, and there's no <laughs> magic. Is quite no, funny. yeah, less magic, more. We, I think, one of the schools they entomb the bad students in the brick walls as a lesson to teach the kids. Hey, do your homework, and that's like a real <laughs> thing. Like, oh no! So there aren't are in the walls. There are. <laughs> there are children. dead children in the walls. <laughs> Amazing. Forty oh, um, k, everyone. <laughs> um, but while he was in vibe. this, yeah. Mm. I, I don't know. We all, we're all like, oh, I grew up in a pretty rough school. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I say like, bitch, please. Um, no dead kids in my walls, thankfully. Yeah, it, I think it'd be quite off-putting. You're trying to do calculus, and all you see is just like Gavin staring at you from the brickwork. You're like, oh god, not not a fan of that. Um, but either way, while Yarrick was undergoing his training to become a commissar of the Imperium, uh, there would be a human raider within the school who had previously been captured. There we go. Sirens going when I'm talking about capturing humans, uh, but <laughs> he would—he had been the secret law. Perfect timing, yeah. London yeah. or what's it like? Um, there we go. So there, this this human raider had been captured by the uh, the, the orcs during his years of uh, pillaging the galaxy and pirating, and uh, he would talk to and speak with Yarrick during his time as a student, and he would impart to him the orc language and some of the things he learned about the orcs during his capture because he'd been captured by them for many years and slowly Yarrick would start to learn the full extent of orc psychology and culture so he could best exploit their weaknesses when he would take to the field as a commissar of the imperium utterly devoted to the imperium Yarrick would be stationed to command the steel legion battalions of armageddon and uh, thankfully be there during the dawn of the second war for armageddon in which the uh the orc warlord known as Garsgul Mag Uruk Fraka would attempt to reclaim his ancestral orc homeworld, once known as Ulanor. So fun bit of trivia, Armageddon and Ulanor are the same place. Um, little side note, during the War of the Beast, the orcs were a bit of a problem. So the Mechanicus said, you know what, we're just going to like teleport Ulanor to this place in this sick sector called Armageddon sector we'll put it over there and that'll trick the orcs and they'll never know it happened turns out the orcs saw right through that they know exactly what it is so that's why they're always clamoring to get it back into their green sausage fingers and um bit of a Shrek reference there for you guys don't you, don't you point <laughs> those dirty green sausages at me um now however with a donkey in like the was it the onion cart and he's making the noise of the you know, he clips his tongue. He's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's the orcs. They just That's the orcs, yeah. Um, but yeah, during the uh, the beginning of the Second War for Armageddon, Yarrick would be stationed within Hades Hive, one of the prominent hive cities of the planet. And uh, in its defense face the orc warlord known as Ugalhard. And in the uh, the battle that ensued, uh, ensued Yarrick would duel this orc warlord 
and though lose his arm in the engagement, kill the orc warlord, cut off his power claw, claim it for himself and have it fitted to the stump of his own arm. So now he's a human soldier outfitted with a, an orc like power claw, big razor sharp talon fingered claw mechanism thing. He also would lose his eye in the in the war and have it replaced with an augmentic known as the Bale Eye, which is capable of shooting a laser beam at his uh, at his enemies with a moment's glare of his so called evil eye. Uh, so during the defense of Hades Hive, some of the other hives would fall. Battle was crazy. They're waiting for reinforcements, and Gazgulmak Uruk Fracker is thinking, "Why is this hive taking so long to conquer? Come on, this should have been done ages ago." And so begins the. Uh, the great rivalry between the prophet of Gork and Mork and the hero of Hades Hive. Yarrick would match and outmaneuver Gazgul at every turn, foil his plots and match his schemes and basically buy time until the Blood Angels would eventually uh, arrive to the uh, to the uh, system, to the Armageddon sector and repel the Orc invasion finally. Now, with uh, the, the Greenskins thwarted, uh, Yarrick would say, I am not letting that orc go away. I'm going to pursue him. Unfortunately, Yarrick would get captured during his pursuit and be tortured by Gazgul for many days until eventually he would try to stage an escape with some of the prisoners on board the orc vessel. Uh, in the attempt, Yarrick, though managing to do some pretty big damage to the ships and almost go out in a blaze of glory he would be uh revived by gasgul after the fray given back his uniform and his weapons to which uh and also a vessel to escape back to the imperium and why when asking why are you letting me go gasgul would state good enemies is hard to find because he loves fighting as all orcs do and yarrick's the best opponent he's ever found so he doesn't want him to die he wants to keep fighting him as long as he can so he lets him go back to armageddon and warns him I'll be back. I'm coming to get you. I'm, I'm accruing a war. I'm going to ruin your day. So you you get as many defensive positions going, as many reinforcements, get the Astartes, get the Sororitas, get some tanks, get some your little flashlights, whatever. Get everything you can. I'm coming to kick the door down and it's going to be a load of fun. Um, need one of those flashlights that you can... Has anyone seen this Amazon video where it's like, this is the most powerful flashlight and it literally can turn <laughs> yeah, it from night to day. Yeah, it can turn it from night to day. Yeah, Man we did say flashlight. Yeah. Just oh, bear that in mind. Torch, isn't it? Tor flashlight is American, is it? Torch yeah. is in... If you give it, give it a bit more... No, it's not a UK torch. Side. It's a torch. <laughs> it doesn't it make a sense. Torch. A torch is a burning <laughs> stick. Is there fire the Statue of Liberty it? hold? <laughs> the flaming flashlight. <laughs> what? <laughs> she has a torch. So, what do you call a burning stick then? A torch. Oh, a torch. Yeah. yeah. That's a torch. My, yeah. My flash, the same, my... They did the same thing. I guess. No, they're not. <laughs> Downward is downloaded. One of those is technology. What a... <laughs> a torch illuminates. Oh, it's the sun a torch then. <laughs> In a way, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it's the world's okay. biggest torch. Oh, this yeah. is a pointless argument, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're here to watch law crimes. Oh, just going man. into weird tangents. Um, however, Any about we're... breakfast, guys. Anyone talk about breakfast? Whilst we're here? <laughs> Don't cook your breakfast today, with don't. a torch. <laughs> um, bring up food. <laughs> anyway, um, hashtag bread not. Anyway, um, during the uh, the escape, Yarrick would. Um, I'm sure I'm sure how we'll get into it in more detail, but several times he tries to retire and he just can't do it. He keeps getting drawn back into the conflict against the orcs because there's no one better suited to combat them. Even the Astartes don't have the same experience that Yarrick has to the point where they revere his pedigree. Um, and as such, unlike in the second war for Armageddon where he was just defending Hades' hive, he would be tasked with the defense of the entire planet during the third war for Armageddon where once more Yarrick would repel the invasion of Gazgul Mag Uruk Fracker during 998.m41. However, despite his success in pushing the orcs back from the greatest orc war ever recorded in human history that exceeded even the Ulanor Crusade of the Great Crusade or the War of the Beast, unfortunately, the most recent knowledge we have of Sebastian Yarrick is during his pursuit to end the Beast of Armageddon Supposedly, he would die at the hands of Angron, Primarch of the World Eaters, and never achieve his life's mission to end the reign of Gazgul Mag Uruk Fraka, the prophet of Gork and Mork. Sad, Ooh. big sad. 
And that's basically all I have to say for the beginner section of today's episode. He needs episode. a book. His death. It deserves he a book. He needs some law. <laughs> that's how GW killed Angron because Gasgol went straight to Corn's domain to. Truly. And then he ass. glared at him. That plotline's already kind of explored, face. isn't it? Who's the orc who lives in Corn's realm? Oh, I can't remember uh, his name. Tusk his name. Killer. Tusk yeah, Tusk Demon. Demon. Oh, no, he's there to have fun. Angron's there for vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> no, Gasgol. Gasgol. <laughs> Angron's there. Wait, in a way, Angron is there for vengeance. Uh, if that's being said, though, any uh, feelings or thoughts, boys, currently on Yarrick? If what's your current like knowledge of him? I mean, I haven't read the books, but I know the so, lore generally. Read, yeah, it's about the he's same badass. as Eli. <laughs> I will, I will say he's not my favorite commissar. It's, it's hard for me to, hard to top Kane for me, but. Yeah, yeah, Eric's cool. Oh, I'm not, enough, I'm not saying enough, yeah. he's not awesome. I'm just saying I like Kane. Kane's he was like cool his on the tabletop thing. back in the day. Kane's like his own thing. He's not even really an actual. Like he is a commissar, but you know what? I mean? Kane is his personality encompasses really act like one. so much more than a commissar. All right, boys, strap in, put down your hentai pillows. Uh. To, yes, right. Put your. I mean, I don't say get off your seats, but I say <laughs> put yourself and sit down because we're about to have. Possibly, we're not talking about space marine super soldiers, nothing like that. We're talking about the best human, just an ordinary guy in the 40k setting. So, uh, you know, as they say, it's the guard, it's the commissar, it's the average, we, uh, not an average man. How dare I state that as an <laughs> average man? It's about old Bailey, hero of Hades Hive. The For some reason, his nickname is the old man, which obviously seems very <laughs> generic. <laughs> Um, I prefer uh, Papa Yarrick. Papa Yarrick, uh, Commissar Sebastian <laughs> Yarrick, a man even respected by Space Marines, as we all. That's quite far in, I won't lie, so we'll have to get to that. Um, but his story starts way before that, as we say, legends are not uh, born, they are created, and it would be on a world called Teo 3. When I first read this book, I thought it was called Talos 3. Real miss opportunity that's not called Talos because that would have been a like absolutely gorgeous. For he loves you. Talos. <laughs> <laughs> um, there would be a little young boy named Bass. Obviously, it would be short for Sebastian, uh, and he was born in this world. Teo three, not really important. It's kind of like a backwater, but his parents were wealthy. They were somewhat cold, so he only knew them when he was about four. I think he was seven. Um, when eventually they would actually pass away, unfortunately. Uh, supposedly they died in a tragic accident at the planetary governor's summer mansion and all their assets were quote-unquote seized for the imperial war effort, which happened to go to the cousin of the governor himself, no less. So we can obviously <laughs> kind of guess what happened there. No, just, a, just a coincidence, sir. Move yeah, along. just a little, little coincidence there. And um, so he... Kind of, he was only seven years old, and it went. It had a rough start, and his parent, even though he didn't really know his parents very well, um, and they basically lost everything. They said, "Oh, but he's only got one sort of family member left." So they sent him off, and they put him on a train. They describe it in the book when he gets on the train. The train is filled with people who are slaves. It's like maggot and cockroach infested oh. and rusty, and he's a seven-year-old boy just sent by himself. It's not quite the oh I sent my son on like a transatlantic flight or anything like that. This is like this is not a gap year. <laughs> yeah, this is the eleven. This is the eleven of that, and he arrives to his first ever hive city, and it's really it's really like hard to listen to it because he immediately gets off and he just pisses himself immediately, <laughs> like literally pisses his pants immediately because obviously he's a kid and he's terrified, and he's greeted by this old man who's like injured and gnarled and his name is the old sarge they call him and he was supposedly an old war vet. he was the grandfather or father to his mother and his, he had like no idea his mother obviously had any kind of history like that and the sarge was very much like oh you little shit i gotta take care of you like you're taking my resources oh, i hate you so he wasn't very <laughs> nice to him in the beginning taking my rations away how dare you? yeah he was pretty, he was like a real old vet. He was not nice. And uh, Bass would have to join the local school. And that immediately, it, it gets worse uh, because unfortunately, 
um, Bass would be bullied straight away. And because he was a little, you know, he was essentially the posh boy who had lost all their money. And now he's come to the, <laughs> the rougher side of the area. And he was picked on by a particular slightly tubbier older kid. We can all, we all see the cliche like in our heads right now. Uh, and his name was, it's a bit on their nose. His name was Craven, but it's like Kevin spelt wrong. Oh. Also, like, it's like Craven as in like if someone is Craven. Silly. <laughs> a little bit on the head there. And Craven and his cronies, they called them. One of uh, which was, was called Judas. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. They would uh, literally attack him pretty much every day after school. At one point, they even stabbed him and he had to just walk home. And it was like, Christ. And every time the old Sarge would just kind of, you know, knit his wounds and said, did you fight back today? And he was like, no. But eventually one day he gets so pissed off that he decides, like, I will. So he brings his, he's like, you know, when someone says like, oh, you shouldn't bring a, a knife to a gunfight. Uh, doesn't matter for Sebastian because he's bringing a knife to a knife fight. And he, they immediately pull out knives on him one time in an alleyway. And he just loses his crap and just launches himself at the bullies. He makes Craven cry, kicks him super hard in the nuts. Um, it's a really big scene in that book. It's like literally absolutely like proper crack in there. Ooh. And then when he gets back, he realizes it's like, well, when Craven's crying, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, so sorry. You know, it wasn't my fault. The old Sarge, he paid me. I know. So, oh. so Bat is like, you're lying, surely. And then. Craven is not lying here. So when Bass gets back, he kind of has that weird Mexican standoff when they're both in the doorway. Like the old Sarge is in the house, and then Bass is sitting there, and he goes, "Did you like? Did you send them, kid?" And then it was like it's a bit of a weird standoff moment where he kind of hates the old Sarge, and he's like, "Why did you do it?" And then it's because the old Sarge goes, "Because I needed to make you strong." It's like, oh, so it was all in the way like training and. Isn't it's the begin? This is where Sebastian Yarrick is kind of uh born. He very much admits to himself, like, oh, I uh, I I did all these fighting, but I actually realized in my own heart of hearts, I actually enjoyed it. I like, and he asked the old Sarge, Will you train me? It's kind of the Uguay moment, but. Uguay's a alcoholic <laughs> old retiree, and he's a bit abusive. Um, <laughs> it's more like like uh, Cobra Kai, where it's just like, oh, the mentor's like, oh, he's got a bit of a drinking problem. He's a bit of a dick, but oh well, he's good at karate. Yeah, a little yeah, bit. Nice <laughs> uh, so old Sarge begins to train him. It's pretty ruthless, but because you know it, this is old guard training. So he is he's this only is a first kid. edition training, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is this is first edition uh, Warhammer training. Um, but unfortunately, one day it would all have to end because something was invading in the skies. And the old Sarge says, uh, the guard never forget. They're going to call me up. And he says, like, remember to be strong. And he says, you know, goodbye, Yarrick, because that's the name of his grandfather. And he never sees him again, unfortunately. And in fact, uh, good old Sebastian wouldn't see anyone at that point because it's actually an orc invasion as Andy mentioned earlier, and the orcs land into Teo 3 and they immediately win. Everything is destroyed and Sebastian has to essentially use his training and he sort of lives in the sewers and goes underground and he hides from all the orcs for months and he's eating nothing. He sets up like little, um, you know, you know, like Vietnam, what they called like the men who used to go through tunnels because they were like short. I can't remember the name of it. It was like a rat something. They all remembers. Um, Probably tunnel rats if I had to guess. Tunnel rats. That was it. Um, essentially, it has to become like <laughs> that. Tunnel snakes. Tunnel uh, snakes. Um, tunnel, tunnel snakes rule. <laughs> <laughs> and he has to... He sets up like weird traps. I want them to like... Well, the... Um, I hold the tiny orcs calls it not Noblars, but the is it Gretchen? Gretchen. <laughs> Noblars. No, it's <laughs> Noblars. No, That's like no, a Star Trek the character. Ogres. Noblars is a thing. Yeah, they, they, they're like the Gretchen for the ogres. And oh, um, the he has a moment where, like, one time it's like him and the Gretchen kind of fighting, kind of like you know the Gretchen's like Chucky, the little like creepy doll, and like <laughs> he has to, like kind of God. stab it. And he's like, voiced by Mark Hamill in the newest film. They're literally yeah. yelling at each other, and he has to like 
beat it up with like he has, he does like weird like booby traps so he kills some orcs that way and he's only he's only like 10 at this point so he's pretty young and it's a pretty horrible existence for like he thinks it's all over and this is just it um he thinks he's gonna die at any point really like he's de- he's a, he doesn't even sleep he sleeps like with knives across his chest like just he doesn't even get full sleep and then one day he's looking over into the orc camp and he sees a sort of caravan of captured humans that are put in a cage and here's this weird moment where he's looking at the people in the cage and he sees a boy who's like his age and their eyes kind of meet and since sebastian has been alone for so long they kind of have a connection of like that like kind of survivor's desperation and they kind of they both and they kiss you know oh it's actually somewhat implied (laughs) some people take this moment as it's implied that sebastian um is somewhat as in his sexuality is up for debate we're not sure but it's not really clear in the book but I mean, again, they're children, so it's kind of harmless at this point. Like, it's, it's not that. But um, this other child, like, he goes up to talk to him. He realizes the, the kid doesn't have a tongue, but he can still speak to him because he's got a brand on his uh, forehead, which means he was a psyker. So they cut out his tongue, and obviously they're persecuted ah. in the Imperium. And the boy, like, talks to him in his mind. And one night, like, he's been, he just realizes, like, I don't want to be alone anymore. So he goes to break the boy out. And then the orcs like sleeping, they're all drunk and it gets, it doesn't go well where the people, this is the bit where you, you know, you're watching a film and like, there's that one person who panics in the film. You're like, you want to grab them, like, hey, shut up, you know? Uh. So some, there's like some people in the cage that are like, they're too desperate to escape as like Yarrick, sort of Sebastian, sorry, gets like the key from like a sleeping orc and they start to panic and make noise. Like one of them is like, let me out, let me out. And then literally gets them all killed and apart from the uh boy because the other ones are just being slaughtered because the orcs have woken up uh little sebastian the boy they run off together and for a bit like it's like it's not within they don't this is the same night so they're not like run off into the you know the sunset or anything like that and they're being chased and they realize that munitions are suddenly dropping around them like there's a firefight happening and that's because the imperium has come back and so they see like the Imperial Guard, but they fall through like a gap on like a roof. They're being chased by the orcs, there's gunshots everywhere. And once they fall down this lair, they're both like, oh my god, we survived. And then the boy uh, unfortunately gets uh, killed here. The other boy, not Sebastian. And he sees it happen in front of him. And he literally sees um, a squad of Imperial Guard come up and they said, oh my god, what have I done? They go, oh no, it's just a little old psyker. They see his forehead uh mark and sebastian just loses it because like that's like literally my only friend i had for months and it's like i just lost it straight away come on and he attacks like he attacks an adult he's only 10 years old remember but he manages like take kind of take down this imperial guard and he just goes like this kid just stabbed me like he just oh it really ow yarrick bit me pretty much and uh they (laughs) kind of knock him out got teeth yeah (laughs) He kind of is like a ravenous dog, but then uh, another uniformed man approaches and said, wait a minute, because he looks at uh, Sebastian, he goes like, hmm, so you've rubbed yourself in dung, you've been used, you've made survival tools, he kind of sees like the genius, obviously the lessons of old Sarge here, and the man says, listen, there's possibly a thing we can do for maybe kids like you, orphans of war, and so he basically says, you know, where are you going to take me? And he goes, oh, well, I see I'm a commissar and I'm going to take you <laughs> to a this scholar Progenian. So this is the kind of the end of the short story here. And this is like more gen- like uh, general law where he now, at the very end of that book, he says like, what's the kid's name? He goes like, Bass, Sebastian. Was it? I'm Bass is short for Sebastian. And then he kind of pauses because he's going to give his real name, his last name, but he decides not to. He says, my last name is Yarrick because he decides to then become sebastian yarrick as a way to honor the old sarge whose name was yarrick so uh Does... sebastian i can't remember his original first gonna, book, I guess is right? it mentioned i think it is it's mentioned like very it's only mentioned once very briefly in the book but it's like again he never uses it ever in even then he's actually not called he literally called him bass throughout the entire uh novel and then he's called him like sebastian right at the end so you don't even know and um he 
basically discards his old name. No one will ever know it. And he becomes Sebastian Yarrick uh, from there on. And he would go join the Scholar Progenium. As we said, it's kind of like crappy Hogwarts where there are <laughs> people in the walls, not Skaven, unfortunately. And this is where he would uh, train ruthlessly to become... Well, eventually they do somewhat specialized later so he's not quite a commissar yet so they go off to be soldiers so he fights in many regiments he sees battle on many planets as andy did mention earlier he learns orcish from a traveling merchant he was supposedly captured by orcs long ago he'd also funny enough he actually would make friends here and he was known for being yarrick was like the kind of more quiet reserved intelligent one but he did have a sense of humor so it would come out sometimes he often made friends with people who were like kind of the opposite of him so he had a good friend named uh commissar seroff who will come up actually quite a bit although we're not going to like him towards the end of this story i i do like how you were talking to how the idea of yarrick learning the orcish language he's talking to the guy and he's just trying like pronunciations like wanker wanker no wanker and just like going through like yeah. the, the the specifics Umi. of like the hard k's and the like the phrasing of like kind of because it's cockney basically orcish language is basically just like oh i am an orc and just yeah Yarek he did would his best impression well apparently he, he picked it up quite well obviously you have to remember as well that's like kind of his childhood trauma as well <laughs> which is a very bizarre so this is kind of where he's definitely despises orcs even from this um earlier age and uh, he would also, at the Scholar Virginium, meet a man who was called Lord Commissar Rasp. Now, Lord Commissar Rasp was a veteran commissar. He was very, very intelligent. I think it goes, it shows really well in the books where, you know, you meet characters that are really well written in a lot of things. You can kind of tell like the intelligence, the intelligence of them comes through. Not that they're using big words or anything like that, but they kind of, there's a little, um, I can't think of the word for it, but there's um, a subtle genius to their kind, the way they talk and they see through people in a way. Uh, Rasp was very good at being a commissar. He'd been a commissar for a long time. And he did have a certain word of wisdom uh, for one of the boys to uh, read out for it. I do have a slight quote, which was a sort of offhanded comment spoken by Mr. Rath, I will ask, I think, uh, or e either Eli or Colin, which one you want to do the first one? They're, <laughs> they're uh, not too... When people have been deprived of ability to act, they will respond to leadership with gratitude and vigor. To have direction becomes a form of salvation in its own right. Harness this human characteristic and there is very little that you cannot accomplish. So that's one of uh, Lord Commissar Rath's kind of initial saying slash bits of wisdom that he will pass nice. on because it's the role of the commissar is much more than just being a soldier it's about as we will see going forward being a symbol and the first time this would need to be uh used um unfortunately it would be actually this book is a really good book so if anyone does want to read the Yarrow book this one i recommend it absolutely uh, but we're going to go through a brief summary of it here this would be on the world known as Mistra or Mistral, not Minstrel, the chocolate that's in the UK that's made by Galaxy. If anyone remembers that, oh, it's getting a bit chocolate. old now. Yum, yum. I know. I did think I called it Minstrel every time I read it. <laughs> and um, Mistral is a an ecclesiarchy world which you don't often see in a lot of Warhammer stories. It's kind of usually it's either not done well or it's just kind of like, a, oh, there's a thing that happens on one of them, but you don't, yeah. this is the first time you see they, it up close. They tend to also be like, oh, that's a, that's a sororitas thing that's in their books. So they try to keep them quite separate a lot of the time. It's like, oh, that gels with that faction. We'll keep that separate from the rest of the setting a lot of the time. Well, we're going to be seeing some of them. Bit of a spoiler there, <laughs> I will say here. But um, good old, this ecclesiarchy world is not perhaps, it's not an incredibly populous one but it is an important one sort of a seat of um monastic power in a way it's ruled by the the you 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 probably will be surprised by this the corrupt cardinal <laughs> known as vargaheim ah. um vargaheim is described in the book as an overweight like just 
you know, you know, like if you're imagining uh, from history, like the Borgias, it's kind of like um, is it Rodrigo Borgia? If anyone knows their history, it's kind of described in the sort of. I've played Assassin's Creed two, and they're in that. <laughs> <laughs> Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, if everyone has done that, he's, mm. I think he kind of is a bit more... Well, I know he's more in two, but he's a little bit at the end of uh, that one too. And Valkheim uh, has asked the Imperial Guard to come to the world to destroy a rebelling so-called noble. There's like a kind of ongoing beef that we'll get into about this. And this starts with an opening battle where uh, Seroth... Uh, Yarrick and Rasp have arrived and they're attacking this noble's compound. It begins like this massive opening battle where Yarrick is kind of following in with the men like on the front lines as they have like tanks and rocket launch like booming against this structure. Yeah, it does grow it like Yarrick carries around a saber and he cuts down a few men. He kind of goes like, oh shit, like this is like weird to be this up close to people and do it by him with a sword. Usually he has a gun. Because it's the first time he's kind of being a commissar rather than just a soldier. And they fight. Well, as they're approaching this compound, the gates kind of blast open. And there's this corrupted uh, titan that walks out. But it's not quite... Like, it's a bit broken, this one. It doesn't have like all the shielding and all the guns working. Something's quite wrong with it. And they all kind of go, oh, that's disgusting, that thing. Uh, Yarrick and his men get up close and they manage to throw some missile launch at it they eventually bring it down uh there's a really weird point in the book where they mention how when the titan is falling over it lets out a death cry like an animal would and they said it's so haunting it made like their whole body shake on the inside and they said as long as they live they would always remember that haunting scream it's kind of like a weird so that you can tell something's a bit wrong with this and they eventually do get further on into the compound uh, only the commissars go into the compound because obviously their mind's a little bit more, let's say, attuned to what they're about to see. And they eventually discover the evidence of a chaos cult. Now, commissars, most of the Imperium do not have knowledge of chaos, particularly the uh, normal Imperial Guard. But obviously, commissars are somewhat educated on it, not as much as the Inquisition would be. And they discover that obviously something as big is brewing on Mistral. There's something that means that they can't just destroy this noble and then they have to leave. There's obviously something bigger going on. They also run into a Inquisitor on this world. This guy, by the way, few in- most Inquisitors in Warhammer are usually pretty intelligent and you know maybe they're a bit a bit, bit of a dickhead sometimes, but they obviously do <laughs> it for a reason. This guy is what you would. This guy is clapped. This guy is a total absolute bell end of a character <laughs> and he is just like he's one of those like um i think someone would describe him as he's been shouting and spewing out ideas for so long he can no longer hear people because he's just he's so convinced he's right he's absolute blow the sound of his own voice kind of character or, or like oh, a Joffrey, he is so Joffrey parallel from game of thrones like oh i'm so cool look at me it's my stuff don't touch my toys where's my you know what i'd call him i'd say he's like a somewhat more athletic rudy giuliani <laughs> if anyone knows the <laughs> reference to that <laughs> which is uh it's in terms of me <laughs> <laughs> not to bring too much real world politics and there's clearly a bit more as they uh sort of venture into the capital of mistral they see that there's th- well first of all yarrick is even though he grew up in a little bit of wealth he is shocked by the absolute ostentation and wealth of the ecclesiarchy everything is dripping in gold and it's obviously statues of the emperors cardinals sororitas everywhere it's one of those ones you go ah this is like church this was what like if you, it would be on the nose church corruption is and it's yarrick is uh particularly uh, lord ross finds it very distasteful and they're not impressed but they often have to kind of show up to these balls and these um evening sort of meetings to kind of you know put on a display because obviously they're meant to be commissars they're meant to be you know yeah, the they're men like in the, tight black uniforms they're like the face of the the guard in a way like you're mm. not going to get a, a typical guardsman going because he's too scruffy it's like commissars they're in charge they're the ones who are specially trained they have the nice hats like put them in charge there they're, they're the nice face of the the military and there's a they kind of get to understand that there's 
it, there's more than just that corrupt noble. So first of all, there's a chaos cult clearly on Mistral. And then there's also, <laughs> excuse me, there's also a problem with uh, the nobles have had so much of their power on the world been taken away by the uh, Cardinal Vargaheim, who's making a power play. It's going to clearly lead to a civil war in some regard. It's not to do with religion at all. It's just about power and politics, which they all play very well. But something is clearly that th basically Mistral's ready to kick open, if you know what I mean. And it does kick open as <laughs> uh, Vargaheim. You know, when someone said earlier, like someone is just a they 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 take their schmeat and they slap on the table. Uh, Vargaheim <laughs> seems to do that, where he <clears throat> for ex for an extra layer of protection, he um, has called that a holy relic be be brought to Mistral, and the relic is guarded by a contingent of sisters of si of sisters of battle. Sorry, and it very much everyone could tell like they're not happy to be here they are led by a lee sister called uh sethano she's very important to yarrick's story so remember that name she's a absolute like get it done kind of uh, woman she's quite cool and the next day they're going to lead the relic through the town as sort of as Wagheim is displaying his power he's trying to lure the nobles essentially into open conflict he's just daring them to do it and yarrick is not Yarrick rasps Seroff, they're not, they're like, something's about to go down, they can feel it. People being kidnapped in the streets, somewhat, there's been rumours of people being going missing, something's wrong. And as they do the parade through the central squares, the entire central square blows up. And, oh. and immediately the city starts blowing up in different locations, and chaos cultists pour out of all the sewers. And then yeah. Vargaheim, by the way, as it's happened, these sisters protect the relic like pretty disciplined um Volkheim is like this is not what was meant this is not what i thought would happen this is a bit more this is a bit much this is clearly not he didn't expect the chaos cult so this has gone wrong for him and what, what makes it properly grim dark here is that this the citizens start to panic and when the citizens panic they start to run and all the guard like get up their guns and they say everyone needs to stay still they're shouting they're like stop 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 but clearly people are too panicked and they actually as much as they hate to do it Yarrick and the other commentators order them to do like like a warning shot nothing happens second warning shot nothing and so they eventually like they fire into the city and then they're line. like get the heavy bolter we need to get this sorted now no, oh no it's so cruel that they fire into the civilians like wipe you know a single shot just like they wipe out a few and that seems to make everyone like stand still and they're like oh order been restored but it's like basically everyone's like crying and like you know panicked and shot like what the hell just happened it's clearly gone out of control all the guard that have been um either placed throughout the city or have been on the march they have been like broken up into sections as explodes explosions have um cut them off from each other and essentially the up the chaos uprising has begun yarrick decides like all the vox is down so they have to start lead the men across the entire city um excuse me there's a few like epic street battles where like some chaos tainted machines like break out of the sewers and they have to like they literally there's a bit where Yarrick is going we need to get out of the way of this thing and literally has to like they break into um houses and then like rush in like buff like headbutt themselves in get up the stairs quickly and then like set up uh, rocket launchers across the place they're like chaos symbols etched onto loads of the machines and the cultists and then. They kind of notice like some of the men if they stare at them too long they get a little bit like dazed and they're like i don't want to fight for some reason and this is the first time where yarrick actually has to kill one of his own men as an as a much a, a commissar probably you is famous for doing he has to shoot one of his own men here and it's one of those moments he knew it would like he'd have to do it eventually he probably would have to kill thousands of men <laughs> it was this. his rite of passage <laughs> in so a way a but... true commissar until you've killed a civilian he doesn't, he oh, doesn't no. feel like good about doing it it's kind of a he literally goes like why do you make me he's like he kind of gets annoyed in his own cell he doesn't say anything but he's like why do you make me do this and then he kind of takes up the leadership of the guy who was meant to be leading um the unit and kind of this is where he learns to quote be the symbol and at least a really epic scene where like munitions are firing down on them as they realize the outer walls so they defended the inner city from like the uprising parts in the sewers 
and they realize, oh, a force is coming to the outer walls. And so they rush to the outer walls. They he reunites with Seroth and the dickhead Inquisitor, who, by the way, got himself captured <laughs> and they had to rescue Ugh. him. And he was not <laughs> thankful one bit. And they eventually lead the men in a, well, basically night starts to fall. And they're being bombed by munitions. One lands like right near them and he can't even hear anything, Yarek, but he literally stands up first and like draws his saber and he stands like above the battle line because he has to be the symbol for people. And obviously everyone rallies around him being like, you know, fuck yeah. So this is where Yarek is. He's exhausted at this point and he just, this is obviously what a commissar is meant to be. There's a night siege where they describe it as the only light is just las guns and it's just an absolute wall of las guns and then ladders that like climb the outer walls they cut down they literally fight the entire night it's one of those like really i think the way to describe it in the book i don't quite do it justice unfortunately but it's an amazing uh scene where you can almost like imagine it. it's definitely like a world war one kind of storming the trenches but on from the other side kind of vibe if you know what i mean and uh yeah, they eventually manage to hold off the outer walls for a bit and they have a bit of breathing room. You're thinking, because, because you know, at this point, everyone's going, oh, quite a lot has happened. I'm exhausted from reading this damn book. And uh, they have a bit of breathing room and clearly it's begun to show that Cardinal Wagheim is not as clever as he thought he was because he's kind of crumbling under the leadership he should be showing. The Sisters of Battle are kind of locked in place they kind of need to protect the relic but they're bit know like we want to get out there and kill chaos cultists and uh mr old uh commissar no mr old vargaheim is not really letting them um eventually they have a meeting and then everyone sort of learns to ignore vargaheim it's like everyone kind of recognizes he's not really intelligent i should also mention this point lord uh lord commissar rasp Yarek's mentor has also gone missing. They're not really sure where he is. They presume he's dead. And as Yarek is kind of putting it together, like something is clearly, you know, how did this start? How did chaos get in? And he kind of puts it together that this isn't, even though they've distracted them with loads of these attacks, they actually want to take out the leadership, which they believe is he like, there's no way they're going from like, oh, they are. It's actually Vargaheim they're really targeting. And he goes, he rushes back into Vargaheim's um, sort of cathedral place. And they realize, like, underneath, a sort of chaos demons have started to spawn. This is the only time where the actual Inquisitor is not a dickhead. And they do, <laughs> him and Yarrick manage to fight it off uh, and some of their men. But it's a weird moment where you can kind of see in the Imperium how they describe it, where Yarrick says to the men, Well done, we killed the, the Xenos allying. With the even though you can see that the men don't quite believe him, but they because there's like something is weird about seeing demons, particularly they're not space marines and they're not obviously built in to handle seeing chaos like that. So a lot of them will obviously like once you see a demon, it's obviously going to kind of mess with your mental state. And only like people who like um, the Inquisitor and Yarrick kind of have the training to shrug it off for a bit. But even when they look at like um, blue horrors and pink horrors, which are the ones they fight, they kind of go, oh, my brain wants to like, you know, implode on itself because it hurts. <laughs> I like the idea of them if they were fighting a blood first, it's like, well done for killing the Xenos, lads. And they're like, that's the weirdest fucking Xenos I've ever seen with fire coming out of its nostrils and a big tongue. And, you know, oh, yeah, they, they like it cuts horns. it in two and it turns into like <laughs> the two of those. So I was like, huh? <laughs> it reforms. Just like into warp confetti like that. I've never seen a orc do that before and this one's red what's going on it's a uh, luckily that that attack goes well and the sisters of battle actually come in at the end they're basically like we're done listening to this idiot fargaheim and they eventually all they gather the forces in the city and they decide like we actually have to we can't stay here this isn't tenable and they leave and as literally as they're leaving this city gets blown up from a distance so it's like oh just in the nick of time and they're realizing that clearly it's actually the nobles who they believed in the beginning it was just political, but now they're actually being corrupted by chaos, they realize. And so they're going to a uh, sort of sequestered uh, noble's house and they're going to attack it because it's clearly a chaos temple. Now, this fight, they managed to sort of um, imagine it's like Masia from, um, I said that pronounced that wrong, but like Masia from Assassin's Creed, 
in your head like the temple sort of looks like that where they kind of you can get in through the gate but they're obviously like side entrances shout out to assassin's creed revelations if anyone has played that old ass game loads of hay bales everywhere pretty much no <laughs> there's ways to get around and um they attack this uh, chaos temple this fight as they get in like they can see hordes like captured people and they're slowly been corrupted and then even the nobles they look all twist and it looks horrific to be in there like literally the floor is soaked in blood just anyway so it's a pretty horrific sight and they eventually attack the nobles uh they find lord commissar rasp and he's chained to a seat and his skin has been flayed off so it, that one is pretty awful uh apparently he'd been beaten like the entire time because the the noble who's in basically started this cult was actually used to be Raph's old friend and they kind of tricked him into being captured and it was a bit sad for Lord Raph because he was so wise and a really good teacher and then he got tricked by sort of um I don't know what's the word for it like where nostalgia if you know what I mean and they start fighting uh inside the halls the sisters of battle Yarrick, Seroth, the Inquisitor um and their forces it's a pretty bloody fight and eventually the nobles they're really from a chaos tome and they start to infuse into one like weird being which by the way like they all attack it like you know like it's like D where all the heroes are attacking one monster but they all get like smashed apart the only thing that, that happens at the beginning of the fight where yarrick like launches forward stabs it in the head and just stuck there and the rest of them are trying to attack it. They get swiped and battered away. They don't even get close until Yarrick like manages to get the sword in a bit deeper. So this greater demon of Zinch, it managed to kind of, again, when everyone in the room was looking at it, everyone was like, my brain is essentially melting. Quite a few of the men around the room just like, I just might as well off myself at this point. And Yarrick managed to hold it together because obviously his... He survived through so much, so his will is strong. And he managed to stab the book that I mentioned earlier, which was kind of how the nobles were fused together into like that weird mutant creature. And they, uh, the greater demon was starting to be banished, and it decided, I need to punish this thing. So it reached out and it started to give visions as it was like melting away back into the warp. And this is where Yarrick would see vision of a things of the future, disaster, and a muscled, green, hateful silhouette. A beast, if you will. So obviously this is clearly uh, a bit of a nod to where his story will be going. A they little bit of subtle foreshadowing. <laughs> this, well, I think this book was written like even after this Second World war of armageddon have been written into law if you know what i mean so that's kind of a mm -hmm. known thing and uh yarrick here they kind of managed to win but everyone is like even seroff who's his friend he's like part of his skull is like broken and like hanging open it's like pretty brutal like this book is really quite grim dark which i think a lot of people might like and if you enjoy that certain uh tone to warhammer and well i guess we all do in a way and um the ending of this book is quite melancholic in a way because even though they've won, it feels like the most pyrrhic victory of all because quite a lot of Yarek's men had died. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, Lord uh, Commissar Rasp, this, he was a great man. He had lived a long time and survived many wars. Uh, as I mentioned, he was like the man who was like flayed on a chair, essentially, and he's like beaten and bloodied. And he they because the noble who had managed to trick him had been trying to turn him to chaos the entire time and sethano the sister of battle she had also looked into the warp as yarrick had and they both when they were like talking to each other they were saying they've probably both been fundamentally <clears throat> both been fundamentally like changed and broken in a way and she asked like what are you going to do with rasp and yarrick says like i just have to like give him a chance because he's going to as as is the duty of a commissar, they execute traitors, and so he needs to see if um, his friend and mentor is actually a traitor. Just quit with there, boys. And unfortunately, 
the way this book it doesn't say what happens in this book if it happens on Mistral, but it's very clearly implied that Yarrick judges that Lord Commissar Rasp uh, is too far gone, and so he kills him. And this basically breaks him and Seroth's like decades long friendship. Seroth was quite like the outgoing, like good friend. He wasn't quite as smart as Yarrick. So whenever they were doing talks with Ross, particularly in the book, the dialogue is really good between the three of them, where it's showing that Yarrick is actually like seeing a lot of time the bigger picture and kind of how a commissar is meant to like the power of being a good symbol in war literally leads to so much more victory for the Imperium, obviously, as we can see. Very much why the Emperor himself is, you know, decked out as, you know, in his golden or my armor. It's a you have to be a symbol. And uh, this is where uh, Yarrick would then be assigned in the wake of this conflict to the Armageddon Steel Legion. So they're here, boys. I don't think they're, they're not in... Are they still resin? Can you buy them as resin? Or are they definitely like not even... I think they're dead now, sadly. Yeah, I'm I, not sure, I, but I, I think know. they are. My only knowledge is that all Astra Militarum players get shafted when it comes to models because their their yeah. favorite stuff <laughs> yeah, becomes discontinued, the and then they have to find niche third, fourth, fifth edition. Like I want some Vestroians. Like, good luck, yeah. mate. <laughs> so you, you need either uh, got to go on eBay to find it. The very rare chance Forge World has, still has them in stock, which usually means a million times the price of regular plastic guardsmen yeah. or a third party. And it's Forge World too. Uh, yeah, so and sorry. it's Forge World. So, so shit sorry, model. Forge World. <laughs> but we, but it, but it's not a secret. <laughs> but but uh, so this is Yarrick's kind of first, you know, proper conflict in I guess like full story. Uh, it's pretty brutal this story, but it's really I wish I could give the book justice, but it's uh, quite well done. And obviously Yarrick has emerged from it, you know, knowing what it means to be a commissar. He knows that he can't quite be as quiet as he usually has been, he needs to be that, you know, what would eventually he would become, which is that overwhelming sense of, you know, just, I am the Yarrick in a way. I think I had a second uh, quote. If it's, is it still in the uh, chat for I'll someone? I'll pop them to back see? in the chat. Ah, oh, perfect. I think, Colin, do you see the second one in there? I don't think it's the one that, it's not I the do. one that Eli did, it's the second one. It's uh, the... Heroes of Armageddon. Uh, it's the when I think it's the. Let me just get that quickly. It's it every be the soldier. One above it, I think yeah. Every, uh, I can read. Ah, it. there it is. Yeah. Oh. All right. Uh, <clears throat> every soldier is a politician to some degree. The higher the rank, the greater the degree. But only the commissar is specifically tasked with those concerns. If you think that your role is simply a guardian of orthodoxy, then you are a fool. Yes, yeah, so Yarrick has learned to be essentially more, it's important to be more than a commissar. Um, as well, just, you know, he under, he's been a soldier for a long time. He understands the men, but then he has to understand what that role will take from him and what he has to impart on others. And there's a short story that I think Eli might like, because we're going to see some Xenos in this next short story. This is set between nice. the next bigger ones. And... I don't the sh the short story is, is set on like a really weird world when they describe it how it's basically what would be like the moon of Jupiter and so they can see like a massive ringed planet which I think is really cool because you don't really get to see like that kind of level of vista described in a lot of Warhammer stuff and they're being attacked by chaos cultists and actual chaos marines on this planet and Yarrick is quite fresh from Mistral but so he's still not he's not he's not you know he's still a veteran in some regards but he's not that old in a way and he's joined up with a uh, military group which is led by two men one of them is quite the good soldier the other man is a very like charismatic he's the char typical charismatic soldier he's like come on lads let's go have a jolly good war sort of that old world war one poster of you know come <laughs> pip, on pip, come on let's go and do pretty some much killing. and yarrick is a bit like oh this guy but then because he's there to obviously to ensure um order he's not there to lead necessarily unless he has to and this conflict is they're trying to essentially attack the cultists in their position the charismatic leader thinks oh this is just a ploy here let's go go they're weak let's go run over the ground and take it it's been a trap 
immediately it's a trap and loads of them get bombed as they do this quite a f- they make it across but they like a lot of lives are lost and this is a story where like this guy who's been very charismatic and like you know the big leader the bit of a showboater the entire time he is like oh crap what have i done and he he goes a bit meek and he's not holding it together and they realize they're being attacked now by their flank so they have to run into these strange caverns that almost look like tombs one could say and as they make it into these tombs the structure of the tombs is a little bit odd this seems to be very angular it's made of a sort of darker kind of stone there seems to be like lines of light that seems to lit up or light up the area and i think you probably guess what's inside this tomb they manage to like kind of set small ambushes yarrick you know helping set ambushes for the cultists so as soon as they walk in through a door they literally like obliterate them and then they actually have some chaos space rings that follow them in there which is you know i don't know how they would even last five minutes and they eventually retreat further in and they see an area where there's like a sort of a descending platform into a mist area and there's something making strange noises in the mist like like scraping metal thing they kind of hide around the corner and they decide like something is clearly in there which obviously i think we can all probably guess what xenos is in there and they let the chaos cultists and space rings walk past and then they just hear screams and they go like you know what that's a fight for another day so let's get back <laughs> at it and it's clearly we're implied, gonna ignore that for a minute yeah it's clearly implied that they're necrons down there and they've gone into a tomb that's clearly <laughs> been invested with some other foul uh meat bag things and they eventually make their way out and there are some other teams that have been separated the good soldier who's the other commander uh yarrick asks the charismatic guy who's kind of been losing it a bit since his failure he asks him you need to tell you need to order the other men in the other tomb area to go further in you know basically make the ultimate sacrifice and let the chaos get taken out with the necron whatever's in there that missed and the charismatic soldier won't do it he just absolutely won't do it he's like he's like, i'm done ordering people to their death and this is where yarrick is a first time where yarrick he actually says he says to himself i actually have to kill a good person and he hates that he has to do it but he does it anyway without hesitation. But it's de- he's killed men who have hesitated, cowards. He's used to killing cowards. But this is the first time he ever thinks, I've actually killed just a good person who wasn't a good soldier. Mm-hmm. So it's quite an interesting like dynamic. And obviously he has to then... He's very angry with the guy in the end. Because like, why do I have to live with that now? Because obviously <laughs> it's, it's on his conscience. He obviously is a human being. He's not like a mindless killer, like a space marine. And they unfortunately don't really succeed in this mission they do have to retreat but they definitely yarek says i got to make a note for whatever's clearly in this tomb because something's awakening here it's a nice short story uh there's another short story which is like it's on another hive city where the steel legion and yarek are ordered to like help uh take out some an uprising not specifically even chaos related they don't really know and they meet uh a sort of contingent of inquisitors so there's a, there's a recurring theme in yarek's life of like inquisitors seem to be like the more dog shit he doesn't get the eisenhorn ones he kind of gets the dog shit versions of inquisitors to be honest if an inquisitor is in a story and it's not an inquisitor book they tend to do pretty badly <laughs> they're never really like yeah. oh in, a, in the best like because they're not the ones who the story's about pretty much yes like the target inquisitors if anyone i don't even know if target's bad to be honest but i just <laughs> inquisitors from wish.com <laughs> the, uh. the, the target store brand inquisitor and the interesting part about this is like clearly the inquisitors are not here to stop the uprising they're here for something else and yarek sort sort of again like puts it together and he follows them and he realizes they're actually not kind of the normal inquisition they're actually the resurrectionist faction inquisition i think there are other boys here want to explain if you guys know what the resurrectionist faction is for the uh inquisition does anyone else know that one can't uh, think of it they the ones who ah. want to kill the emperor oh, and yeah. bring him back to like yeah those kind of guys they want to kill these are the ones who are like proper nutty and they want to kill the emperor <laughs> so he can revive so i mean it's not they're not completely they might not be wrong well i think they're like a there's a even the most recent the lion book the whole plot is the the guy wants to kill the emperor so he can return to life which supposedly is like 
obviously everyone's like it's a big no-no even the lions like that's just a dumb idea I mean, uh, it, it could work. work it could work possibly it's just the high, high risk high reward <laughs> It could perpetual. Work. It would work. It's just a matter of, oh, well, what's going to happen in the time it takes for him to respawn? Yeah. I think Terra would, Im it's implied that Terra would basically implode if he didn't, if he doesn't keep resurrecting or something mm. like that. What, what's, what's one planet? Yeah, it's true. Earth, so bro, true. it's Earth. Yeah. So I what? live in it. <laughs> we just, don't just live in it. It's world 40, now. Just years My bones are buried deep within it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, the Imperial Fist need to find another planet to recruit oh. from. Big whoop. Mm -hmm. Good old, only Necromunda. And uh, <laughs> this um, sort of, he, in, he sort of clashes with this resurrectionist faction because they're clearly... They're not here to help with the uprising. They're here to do their own nefarious stuff. They try and kill him a few times. He does end up like taking some of them out, making some of them like back off in the end. And they do kind of use a steel legion to sort of stop the uprising. It's just a small short story, but it's an interesting bit of like Yarrick is not a, like he knows it's not his place to question the Inquisition in a way, but he sort of goes, "I've kind of got a hunch that you kind of don't really fit in with the Inquisition. You're actually a kind of far off order of it." And Yarrick would go on to serve with the Steel Legion for a long time. But this is where we have like a huge kind of time skip. Uh, Yarrick has been, when we first meet him, he's sort of implies in his 40s or like maybe, yeah, early 40s, which is considered young in the Imperium or at least for Commissars. And then we next join him when he's quite a bit older, but he's had rejuvenation um, treatments. So he has been, even though he's doesn't, I think he says it looks like he's, still like possibly late 40s but he's actually like near 100 essentially in his you know in his bones so even though he looks young and he could probably fight young he actually still like feels like he suffers it's like oh my back you know i mean he still aches <laughs> my back aches oh and oh there's green skins oh get me bolter oh me bloody back <laughs> me bloody back oh my knees click and um <laughs> every guy hitting their 30s right now um <laughs> i'm all right for now and uh, this is where we, uh, this is the best book, in my opinion. This is Armageddon. So this, we meet Yarrick as he arrives back to Armageddon. He goes to the capital, Hive City. And uh, for people listening, Armageddon is, as Annie said earlier, it's a pretty important world. And it is, at this point, uh, inhabited by many different um, Hive cities. So huge, like, you know, basically city stacked upon city, 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 basically a, dystopian hellscape uh armageddon is clogged full of smoke is industrial to the extremes it's all a lot of it is desert they do have a jungle in their equator but it's considered quite fucking horrific if i may swear there <laughs> like it's considered awful and um essentially the world is clogged by smoke and then only the rich get to basically not they get to live kind of above that layer and everyone else it's is just suffering Rorax. Yeah, it's, just, it's pretty much it. It is very much a hellscape. It's, it is pretty horrific. Industrial Revolution levels of horror, but, but worse. Uh, isn't it also one of the like premier weapons development and production? Yeah. like oh, you want guns made? Armageddon's one of the most like important ones for arming everyone because it makes so much weapons. Very much so, and even just to also note how bad it is the, the armageddon obviously they wear like masks the steel legion they wear it even on other planets as well kind of like the um uh, who are the infamous ones but only wearing the gas masks uh the greek krieg. creed krieg or yeah greek creed creed like, yeah. Uh, creed uh krieg also kind of a similar look and uh yarrick arrives to somewhat of an ambush he meets with Lord Commander Serov, so his once old friend, and th they. Yarrick doesn't hate him, but Serov despises Yarrick at this point because he's the one who killed Rasp, and he can't. He never quite ever let it go, and they've he kind of hated him for decades at this point, and Serov just basically uh, managed to advance beyond Yarrick because Yarrick was given, you know, basically crap work for many decades he's ambushed in a meeting with the overlord of armageddon named herman von strab there seems to be now Boo. it's not a subtle link but it, it seems to be the theme of the 
evil guy in Yarrick books having a German sounding name sometimes. <laughs> now, I don't know if there's any historical <laughs> relation there, but there seems to be a bit What are you link. referring to? There's never once mm. been an evil German. No. Not one. Um, <laughs> just, fic- <laughs> just fictional ones, like the one in yeah, Zombies called point. Richtofen. <laughs> <laughs> only, only in cod Ooh, like every awesome. vampire ever in fantasy cod zombies <laughs> and um they kind of meet in it's designed as an ambush where yarrick is said he is basically forced to retire and he's being sent Aww. to hades hive to train essentially some guard and Yarrick even debates this point, like, should I actually just take out my pistol and shoot him in the face even though I die? <laughs> and because he's just so pissed off with this. And even the, the over, again, described as an overweight, richly decorated, evil villain character who doesn't care about the common people sort of thing. Like, Von Straub's a little bit smarter than uh, Vargaman, you know, back in the Mistral days. But... Could I? Yeah, could, could I drop some Von Straub lore that I love? Go for it. Uh, his rise to power was because he was so unbelievably incompetent uh, that his siblings did not consider him a threat worth worrying about <laughs> when they were trying yes. to become planetary governors. Uh, <laughs> and so he j- he had them killed because they assumed he was such an idiot that he could never uh, pull it off. Dang. Well, he might just wow. live up to that reputation as we see <laughs> going forward. Um, this is clearly... Von Straub and Lord uh, Commissar Seraph have clearly had an alliance here. And Yarrick is going to be sent to Hades Hive, forced to be retired to live out, obviously to die as a nobody somewhere, just training little recruits, which is not what clearly a commissar should be doing. And But that would never get to happen because clearly something has been going awry with the warp in the area for some reason. And uh, before... Yarrick could even get to Hades Hive, which is one of the smaller Hive cities. They see in the sky this massive, giant, moon-sized base rocketing towards Armageddon. This would be actually where they're actually having a parade at the day, and everyone's like, oh, crap. And they realize like something is about to just smash us. The, the guarding fleet of Armageddon is immediately munched in like a second like it just gets like flattened it'd be like a fly getting hit by like a football or a you know basically in 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 midair it's absolute crunk and even here yarek just realizes like everyone is like looking away and scared but he actually stands up and like stares at it hatefully because in his old age he's become a little bit more hateful and gritty as as much as reputation and he even says in, to himself now, like, I need to play the role. I need to be the symbol again. I need to start doing it immediately. And so in his best see Clint him. Eastwood impression, he goes, is that a damn green skin on my lawn? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. And um, yeah, immediately, as we said earlier, good old, you know, quite competent uh, Herman von Straub. Because he's so corrupt, he, this massive moon, like, l- slams into the planet, like, quite far away like below the equator line and like the whole planet like shakes a little bit and he doesn't immediately like send out like their forces to attack it they kind of all lock up into their high cities and he sends out like a token force held by guess who yarrick who's clearly Mm. meant to die um here and yarrick is absolutely like he can't believe like he does we there's no way we'd be able to beat whatever's coming for us unless all the forces of the high cities unite but never mind, a token force is sent out. Yarrick also reunites with a very old face here. It is the uh, battle sister known as Sethino, who was previously on Mistral. Although something has changed to her since then. Her garbs are no longer decorated. I think in... It might have been the Barbed Thought Rose or the Poison Rose, I think was the name of her, her order. Because since the events of Mistral, her order has been wiped out as it was deemed a heretical, which is very weird because it's not, you think like they didn't turn to heretics. I think they maybe, it's one of those ecclesiarchy things where like they basically didn't turn out to be the way they wanted them. Do, so you, they were, do you remember what the order was called? Pierced Thorn, something like that. I think that's very, the, yeah, that's like, is it, if it's not the Sacred Rose or the White Rose. It's not Rose one of the main ones. The, it was a minor yeah, one. Yeah, it's like a minor, my, minor major. There's like, 
Militant Majoris and there's Militant Minoris. So it's one of those yeah. sub ones. And so he meets with her and it's really funny because as soon as he sees her, he goes like, oh shit. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> like, he basically knows like, as soon as I see you, I know things are bad because she obviously, she is, she's the only one who's allowed to live uh, because she was the only one considered not corrupt um, from the order. So, but she's lost all the color in her clothes. She's basically is decked in greys from now on. And they form an alliance with the uh, princeps known as Manaheim. Princeps are the pilots for massive titans, who's one of the titan legions who basically reside on Armageddon. Because they're the people who like kind of have their heads on together. And uh, Yarrick and Sethano, they eventually leave the city together with Princess Manaheim like, staying behind to, well, first of all, guard the corrupt Herman, who he has to follow orders with, unfortunately. And also to kind of encourage them to actually go out and fight because as much as Herman is pretending he has it all figured out it's like oh I've got it it's all good people it's all good you know smoke smoke the hashish yeah, and don't relax. worry about <laughs> it that moon that crashed in the pie it's fine don't worry about yeah, it it's he, fine he we'll doesn't just get he, a painted decorator we'll just fix it it's fine don't worry it was he's like he definitely doesn't have it together <laughs> so they um are roaming across the plain to wherever this supposed enemy forces obviously it's orcs the orcs are here the war has arrived and this first attack doesn't even get close it goes so poorly because they are set upon immediately as they are like crossing these desert plains and this is where they first start to hear the names chanted by the orcs they hear the name Ogulhard, like you know the orcs are crying out to their war boss and they also hear the name gazkal which Yarrick kind of feels weird about hearing. Like whenever he hears it, I think his his left arm sort of starts to like tingle and his and his eye does as well. So it's kind of a bit, you know, like more subtle foreshadowing. Yeah, destiny, destiny. He feels the pain inflicted by the greater demon on Mistral years ago, and this attack goes so poor. They immediately get set upon, and like Yarrick and Sethno are in a tank, and it just gets blown up, and they get like thrown over to the side. They crawl out. And the orcs are on bikes and they descend upon the soldiers who are, not a lot of them are in transports, so quite a few of them are walking. And Yarek just literally leads from the front, is like, people are like, what do we do? He's like, we just, you just have to run to the next hive city. And like, whenever make it, like, I don't say, I didn't say stop and complain and then run to the next hive city. I said run to the next hive city. And they, because they know the orcs are going to catch up to them anytime soon. And there's this weird, like, epic scene where, the orc bikes have gone like around the flanks and eventually they start to like head on charge them. And Yarrick like doesn't even stop. Like they just, he's just like, he's yelling in fury and anger, be like charge. And so there's a horrific scene where the orc bikers just smash into the Imperial guard. And it's described as like an actual like flurry of meat and bone everywhere, which is pretty horrific. And, but obviously eventually because of Yarrick's, you know, thinking, they eventually the the orc bikes do stop because they get clogged up, and then they descend upon them and then they take them down, which is like absolutely mental. And they eventually do kind of like the orcs go like, oh my god, they're crazy, like the humans as well. Because obviously Sethano is like Sethano doesn't care about anything. She's seen the warp, doesn't care. She's dead in the inside, and Yarrick is just like full of anger. They have a weird reaction to both, obviously seeing hell. And they eventually make it to, I believe it is Hive Tempestora. Yeah. Now, Hive Tempestora uh, is slight one, of, not the, the biggest hive cities, but it's a decently sized one. Quite a few billion, I think even a few million people live in there. And it's not going to, basically, they were expecting reinforcements to the hive city, but obviously Herman von Straub is clearly not prepared for this battle at all. And uh Yarek says we can't hold this like we just cannot hold this city but we can do something with it so they he says like the civilians are allowed to either fight or flee he gives them that option many of them choose to flee and even though some of them do flee they manage to like leave before the orc army gets there they are eventually every single one of the millions of people are ran down by orcs and Yarek knew it would happen but that's like how horrific this siege and this like armageddon war was Every single, let's just describe that like every single human died from that, like millions and millions strong, sort of um, great leaving of people. And Yarrick decides they need to 
essentially damage the orcs. They can't save Tempestora, but they can hurt the orcs. So they get the water system that goes around, like all the pipes that filter and like send water throughout the entire uh, hive city. They just change it and fill it with Prometheum. One of the guys who's in control of that goes like, that's crazy. I'm not going to do that. And Yarrick just goes up to him and like, just kills him straight away. The guy's like, I'm you sure. Bang. <laughs> the guy's in the middle of like apologizing because he didn't realize a commissar ordered it, but he just kills him anyway. He's like, there's no time to apologize or anything like that. And so they managed to fill it with so Prometheus. Yeah, like Prometheum is like <laughs> running through the entire city now. And they set up like an ambush where they try and bait the orcs in. And so some of the people have to hold the line there, but then a lot of the men who are still with Yarrick, they will start retreating through the city. And eventually they just stop booking it. And they're like, they're, they're like, we've got to get out of here at this point. And eventually they set off the massive explosion. And it like the blast wave literally knocks them all off their feet. And they're like, their ears are ringing. And they eventually make it outside the other side of the city. Only to see, it's, it's so funny in this part of the book. Because obviously, we're just, there's like all that horrific death before. But then immediately the next scene is, they're like getting into transports. They're like, you know, we need to get to the next high city. And they look to their right i think and then in the little forest bit there there's one orc who's like waving at them and it's like and then they shoot it eventually and it's yarrick realizing that this gas call had realized what was going to happen he'd pre-planned like basically what was going to happen in this he knew it was a trap essentially and so he had sent essentially like the fodder orcs to go into Hive Tempest story. It wasn't the main orc force in any capacity. And that and he's realizing he just and he's taunted Yarrick with that little messenger. And then this is where Yarrick first like realizes, oh crap, this orc is actually smart. And he's obviously been fighting and studying orcs for a long time. So he's kind of going, Oh crap, this is not a war like we've ever fought before. I feel a bit sorry about that orc though. It's like, oh, Gaz was like, Gub the Gormless, I'm going to send you to stand by the Vorus and just be like, you're useless. Like, you, he's like, oh, I got a special mission. That's pretty cool. Does I'm going to go confront you. Wait. Poor guy. He gets to fight. He's got all he needs to be a happy orc. Mm, yeah. no. you, uh, you think it's that bad so far. So basically, uh, it, just, it says in the book, when Hive Tempest, because not everyone could also get out of the Hive too. So billions of people just died in this Hive city, which is like, when, you, when you're when reading this book, you kind of go, oh my god, like the kill count is enormous. It's ridiculous. But it gets worse because as they are leaving, because obviously Yarrick's having to make the hard decisions here about, he's doing this to save all the other Hive cities. And it's not working currently. So they retreat to another Hive city, I can't remember the name of this one, uh, but it's not going to be on the map for very long because eventually they get there and they've had time to set up a defense somewhat there. But the entire orc, the true orc force just starts to arrive and they literally see it like slowly, like the silhouettes of the gargants and all those things, like quite slowly. Um, like that scene in Helm's closer. Deep where they just see the orcs, appro- the orcs approaching, they're just like this is the end oh and that it but, raining. is that but worse because when they look they said it's not ending but like they said like mm. it's still going on for miles like it's just an absolute wall of orcs and like huge and they can see that these these orcs are armored they have really good or you know orc versions of equipment so this was clearly the main orc force and it's even larger than the one they had seen at tempestora but they don't have a plan to blow them up and so they realize that they can't they do have like an initial uh, sally from the gate. But again, Gaskell knew that this would happen or he calculated it. And so again, he sent like a way, you know, it was like a diversion. Then he sent a um, counterattacking force to try and cut off Yarrick's men, which they do get quite a few of them, but they managed to just get back into the settlement walls. And Yarrick and Sethano are talking. They realize like we have to sacrifice this hive city as well which is slightly bigger than Tempestora. And they realize like, oh, we just, we have to buy more time so we can basically uh, defend the other ones. Whilst Yarrick decides we need to call for aid because this is clearly beyond what normal humans can fight. And this is perhaps the most, like, it's a very weird scene coming up, I'll explain it. But it's also the one of the most grim dark scenes where 
this hive city has a prison complex on an island like next to it because like, there's some water around it and they and then basically sethano goes all right we're gonna buy some time i have an idea and they basically have this massive like huge elevator that then they arm prisoners and they basically arm prisoners in waves and then they just send them at the orcs invading and essentially it describes like two waves of meat continuously clashing because sethano is you know becoming her true sister of battle like she's chanting out redemption for the emperor for all you prisoners death redemption in death sort of thing and these prisoners are like absolutely like zealot and furious and they lose it and so they basically match the orcs's kind of fury further yeah further yeah and it is a very cool scene obviously horrific the way they describe it but it's literally like two walls of fanatics like smashing into each other and it's the first time that the humans are meeting the orcs and like holding them still and there's a weird scene where like one of the prisoners is like sort of had like a come to jesus moment where it's like oh the emperor and then he's like watch me sethano like the sister of battle watch me die in like glorious vein he gets like grabbed by um i can't remember the name of the orc thing but it's like two pins it's like a crab and it basically slips him in half and it's like oh god Oof. it's uh and that basically happens essentially for an entire night <laughs> the prisoners are just brought up also some of the guard are still alive in this city but they're fighting but and all i can much... hear are just prayers and people screaming and they're like oh god i'm not gonna get Sethano, any yeah. tonight. Sethano holds <laughs> it down she's chanting like war prayers to like send them into fervor the entire time whilst the orcs are like loving it and Yarrow uh sneaks back into the capital city just you know he literally says like screw herman i need to send a message herman doesn't want to send out a message because he realizes it will make him look weak and he might lose control of armageddon so he's not asking for help but Yarrow says screw it and so he makes a plan like he basically steals his way into the ashopathic choir and he kind of says to them listen we're all gonna die unless you send a signal and they base and they go the warp's screwed if we do this we'll probably die and they went yeah it's like yeah what does what choice do we have and so they kind of rebel against herman and yarrick and a few of the guards there like have to defend them whilst they're being attacked by herman's own guards trying to send a signal eventually this massive like warp scream goes out and then they say like you know they yarrick's like you know call the adeptus astartes we need them he does succeed, but then Herman does capture him and basically go, listen, you're going to, you know, he's like, well done, you know, all sarcastic. And he realizes, like, I can't really kill a commissar in front of people because now, like, Yarek's in the light sort of thing. People will see him. So it's like, yeah, just gonna, especially now he's he, been defending, like, oh, you know, that guy's yeah. done all that work defending you all. Like, so now he yeah, properly sends idea. him to Hades Hive, while Sethano is basically using that other Hive City as like a delay tactic. But, billions of people have died at this point in fact herman von strab during this conflict actually sells out one of the other higher cities to the orcs like opens the mm. gates as like a bargaining chip that's how like crazy he is and when yarrick arrives to hades hive he makes his vow like i've had two hive cities die i'm not having another one die like it's just not gonna happen even though hades hive is considered one of the smaller ones but hades hive is positioned quite well it was an old mine it's positioned against a mountain so he's like i can actually make a plan here and he he actually does something crazy initially well like he hasn't done something crazy about because he's been fighting the entire time he walks into the middle like the gang territories like with just one guard and they both say they'll go like oh what's this little pretty boy doing and he just like stamps a guy and just like you know take me to your leaders because we're about to be attacked by orcs so they kind of unite the gangs of this hive city and basically goes, I just need good fighting men. And um, he also takes over the city. The governor tries to run away. He tries to like, it's a funny scene where he's like, I'm praying in a monastery. I swear, I'm just praying for guidance. <laughs> There's a secret ladder underneath the monastery and he tries to get out. And uh, he tries to run away that way, but they catch him and kill him. And um, they... Yarek like takes control he does his great speech of like i am defending hades hive you know people were like oh my god that guy is incredible he's like he's so Yarek obviously not the most charismatic figure but his speeches are incredible and obviously you can see like his absolute hate in his eyes the determination the grit to 
continue, you know, there was, I didn't mention it earlier, but there's a phrase that much as like what Lord Rasp had said to him, which is observe and learn, which is a kind of thing. It's hinted that Gazkor has been using that a lot. He's been observing many things and worked out how to fight humans. And Yarrick needs to learn, needs to observe and see how to actually beat Gazkor now, or at least this orc force. And so they begin this proactive defense. They use the mines that like, there's like mine shafts underneath Hades that stretch out way before the city. And obviously the orcs are coming. And they're preparing this ambush. They've got bombs everywhere, like underneath. And they're like, they're the little hatches, they're ready to pop out. And then Yarrick hears something and he goes, oh my God, this is why Herman von Straub has not been worrying the entire time. Those are virus bombs. He's going to virus bomb his own planet. He's absolutely insane. So they actually run back into the mines and like they're running back like like fuck and then just like <laughs> running back to get in and the bombs do go off. Some of Hades Hive uh, does burn, like a few people, a few thousand die. But because the virus bombs are from the Horus Heresy era, they're so old that quite a few of them didn't go off properly. But a lot of the orc force was actually killed by that. Not a lot of like around the planet, but the one attacking Hades Hive. And so they kind of go, Yarrick's like, oh, you know, curse Herman, he will die for this. Because once once the Imperium finds out you use a virus bomb against your own planet, that's kind of like, we can't have you around. That's, that's a war crime right there. That's actually dumb. <laughs> and that's the Imperium saying that, like, that's a war. Oh, mm. <laughs> yeah. And um, they sort of run back out because the orcs don't care that their friends have been turned into sludge. And they prepare the next, they prepare the ambush and eventually they set off the bombs that are in, in different mines and eventually all the gangs and the Imperial Guard that have been formed into units by Yarrick, they kind of like leap out and they just basically butcher the first wave of orcs. It's a really cool moment in the, where it's described that like Yarrick like puts his foot, you know, like someone stands on a rock and looks majestic. Yarrick kind of does that thing where he stands like really high up, even though he knows he could get killed by doing that. And he goes, he's, he's literally Yarrick the symbol. And the orcs see him and they actually start to feel fear. It's the first time it's described like the orcs feel fear because they see this absolutely raving, angry faced human who is like defying them and cutting them down. So he, and he's standing you know, on a tactical rock of all things. You can't match it. <laughs> on oh, a good old tactical rock. And um, it's an absolutely epic scene where he kind of. He's literally like fire. He's literally like cool guys don't look at explosions kind of thing. It's everywhere around him, and they have their first victory. So they retreat back into the mines, and then they realize the orcs. Yarrick is, you know, he's been a soldier for a long time as well, so he's no dummy. He realizes the orcs now know about the mines, so they use that to their advantage. I love this scene, which is they see the orcs come. From, they hear them come from the mines, and they basically like plant people in the walls and <laughs> like the, the little like <laughs> from his days in the scholar progenium he's like that's not a bad idea <laughs> it literally is like you've got um steel legion in your walls essentially <laughs> and they kind of pop out and they're like they basically ambush the orcs kind of like a prison fight in a way and um, they burn them in the minute and they also at some point they drown them there's a bit where they start to flood it with water so the orcs will drown there's some of their own men still like a few of them still stuck down there but yeah it's like we don't have time we have to do it you know he, at this point he's already condemned so many people to death but it's all about the ultimate victory you know sparing more lives and they like drown the own the orcs and kind of the gangs are like fight like some of the gangs are like wielding like weird ass you know necromunda like chain axe things and it's like fighting yeah it's like i've made my own force but meanwhile this is happening the siege above ground has still continued because the orcs are chanting and then they're getting raved up by someone quite big but it's not who you think they're chanting the name Ugluhard 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 everywhere and eventually they hear this chant even now down in the deeper parts of the mines where Yarrick is and they realize like something is happening so this uh, contingent of his manages to get back to the uh, siege walls and they see the captain who was supposedly in charge of the wall he's basically been battered and left off to the side and here stands before everyone with well, a it's a massive orc his name is obviously Ugulhard. he's probably a chief one of the men underneath gazkul and he's got this massive power claw and a lot of the fighting is stopped because they kind of see like oh this is the 
that's the that's the tough Yumi git from earlier. So a lot of them are like, oh, they kind of stop and they let the duel happen. And obviously Yarrick is just an old dude. So it doesn't, he's not going to win initially. Like Ulkar's like playing with him and he eventually grabs Yarrick's arm. I think it's his left arm. Yarrick feels his eye. Like he obviously loses his eye at some point here. And he feels, also his like left arm, it's starting to burn, but it's not because of uh, what's happening here. It's definitely the, it's a wound from when he saw the demon. Like it's basically fate is coming to happen. And he's like, Ulkar's playing with him. While Yarrick tries to stab him with his sword, uh, he grabs Yarrick on his arm. It literally lifts him up. He's playing with him. He starts to squeeze. Like he feels his bones break, and eventually it squeezes so hard his arm severs, and Yarrick like falls to the ground screaming. Uh, Ugalhard is like laughing. He's enjoying this, like throwing the arm around, like way, way, way. You know, like a little uh, <laughs> like jersey or something like that. And <laughs> Eventually, Yarrick like is about to pass out, but he like bites through the pain, and he kind of goes, you know, he, even though he's just an ordinary man, he kind of like, I am not gonna die here. He gets up and he like surprisingly managed to like stab Ulgahard, and well, in the neck essentially, and Ulgahard is like, what the hell? And he eventually just cuts his head off straight away, and he picks up his head with his one good hand, and he like shouts, literally, I have it here. I am Yarrick. He does in in the green skin tongue. I look. Oh, I should do that again because I should do this justice. I am Yarrick. I look upon you and you die. So, and he's like doing that like way above the orc line and they all like start to run because they're terrified of him. And eventually Yarrick goes, fuck, and he just passes out. <laughs> <laughs> and then just, poof, hits yeah. The neck. And then this well is where. deserved nap time. He, yeah. I mean, he, he did. And then, um, uh, as he recovers, he basically takes Ulgahard's power claw. Uh, be careful if you ever make a Warhammer quiz and you clearly think it's a unique item, but it's not, apparently. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you may get in trouble. And um, he takes that as his like badge of office from Ulgahard. He has these, you know, the bionic old, you know, the bale eye with the laser put in. And the, he- the Siege of Hades Hive continues, but it continues for months. Like Yarrick has managed to slow down the pace of the entire war, and there's a cool bit where like Yarrick often leaves like ambushes that are still like the orcs trying to get through the mines underneath, and they like hit the power claw like will reach out like claw through an entire wall and like cut down orcs, and then he always leaves one orc alive to basically spread the message. That's he's learned like he needs to, you know, observe and learn like how much he can take from the orcs he needs to be feared not by his own men in a way as much respected but feared by the orcs too and so he becomes old bale eye you know the one that orcs talk reverently about and eventually the space marines do come you know they blood angel salamanders i think marines malevolent come to the <laughs> as well for some reason Ooh, oh no um, <laughs> and armageddon is eventually saved although mostly Hades Hive did fall but eventually obviously when it's cleansed from the orcs Yarrick is held up as a hero uh Seroth and well Herman von Straub goes into hiding he apparently just goes into a bunker he's like oh crap I can't be seen you know, so the orchid part the, you know the guy who everyone knows had like blocked the toilet at a party or something and um, <laughs> the Seroth goes away in disgrace because he just chose to ally with Herman rather than actually do his role as a commissar because he hated Yarrick more than he loved his role in a way. And um, Yarrick was like, oh, I could retire now. I'm done. No, he couldn't. He couldn't stomach retiring. The absolute Chad couldn't handle it. He's a so, workaholic. <laughs> pretty much. And so Yarrick would rejoin uh, the guard or the commissar, commissary. I don't know what the thing's called there. Commissariat. And, commissariat. And he would create an army and he would chase a uh, gazkal to the world of golgotha and the problem at this time was that uh yarrick was a legend he was a big symbol but uh much of the imperium is quite clearly corrupt and so he has to make a lot of compromises in creating this like you know this army that's going to chase gazkal so many of the people he recruits he has to kind of he like you know it's like six sons of nobles who maybe don't have as much military experience but the fathers are willing to lend him his little precious son an entire regiment so 
the army's got a lot of inexperienced men in it, but it also has some of the veterans of the second war of Armageddon. They've chased um, them all the way to the world of Golgotha, where they are planning to attack Gazkul, like in person, because Yarrick hates and despises him. And unfortunately, they've run into a trap. Golgotha, G- Gazkul is not dumb as an orc. And as much as he's been like a kind of distant figure for Yarrick for a lot of this, this is now where they actually get to know each other up close because they kind of only know each other by rumor. And uh, Gazkul ambushes them at Golgotha. The Imperial Army does poorly because of the inexperience of some of the soldiers. And Yarrick is essentially ambushed. Loads of the men who were like, who had survived the Second War of Armageddon and had followed Yarrick since Hades, like men who like he had known for years, like on a personal basis, they all die pretty much in this fight, which is very sad. And this is the first time where Yarrick is like standing, he, like his tank is destroyed. It's like his famous like Bane blade that he rides on top of, and he's like standing like in like a haze of smoke and fire. He sees all the orcs around him, and then he finally sees him in person, Gazkul Mag Uruk Thraka, and he is, he, he was he literally is a, a walking. He's not walking tank. He's a walking stack of tanks. This thing is <laughs> so big, and it's the first time they come face to face, and Yarrick is like basically knocked out because he's been captured, and. When Yarrick awakens, he finds that his power claw has been removed. Obviously, he's only got one arm. And he doesn't have his bail eye. He's got one eye as well. And he is chained up, held over a pit. And he is face-to-face with Gazkul. And even though Yarrick's an old guy, he's an experienced soldier, he sort of says, I should hold it together, you know, show him nothing. But he can't hold it in, and he just starts yelling in Gazkul's face, like, you will die by my hand. Because he just, you know, for the amount of people who have died to Gazkul. And he literally yells at him, but Gazkul's just staring at him. And he's kind of, re- he starts to realize that Gazkul is kind of inhabiting the lessons of a commissar. Like, Gazkul is watching him and learning, which is like, oh, like, he's actually doing what I have did as a commissar. And, like, I had to learn and be a symbol, but... Like, so it's a weird parallel where like in a way they're the same thing in in each other's species. That old movie cliche. You're not so different, you and I. Like, oh, Pretty much, I yeah. And they're like staring into other. Like he's insulting him, but Gazgul just smiling the entire time. In fact, actually, one of the orcs even makes a joke and like pokes Yarrick, and immediately that's the only time like Gazgul's smile drop, and he just kills the orc immediately and throws him down this pit. And it takes a while. Like it's a funny scene where like Yarrick goes like. Oh, he's not landed yet. And eventually goes like, doof. And he's like, oh, that's quite far down. And uh, Yarrick is like, I don't know what, you know, there's basically no escape here. They've He realizes they've been taken to a space hulk. So he is somewhere, he doesn't know where he is, but he knows he's inside a space hulk. And Gazkul doesn't say anything. He just keeps staring at him. And eventually he grabs the chains and just cuts them. And Yarrick starts to plunge down into the darkness. And Yarrick thinks... Oh my god, I get to die, thank god. You know what I mean? My end of my service to the Emperor. And then he lands in some water. And he realizes like he landed in like a tiny like water pen bit, whereas the orc next to him like splattered around. And he's like, Oh god, I lived. How annoying. Um so he gets <laughs> not out the same of the as, water. Same extent as Dante, but still not happy about it. <laughs> Pretty well, in a way, yeah. And he get he climbs out of this water thing, he's feels weak and he's dirty and he's you know, it's a bit of a hellscape. There's not very much light. There's like growing mushrooms, like glowing mushrooms around the area, which kind of give light. And he starts to see like weird chitinous creatures, like start to eat the orc's corpse. And he realizes that's the only thing that lives down here. And so basically he has to relive his childhood that he did when he was um, a boy and the orcs first attacked. He has to live in this like secluded area. Like basically he starts to kill the bugs one by one. But each time he does it, he's like, this bug is bigger than me, stronger than me. I have to, like, surprise it. And if I don't surprise it, I'm literally dead. He has to keep killing the bugs because he can, like, take off their claws. And he uses that to, like, basically slam it into the wall. Because he just because the man can't give up some reason. And he's like, my oath. To the, his, his faith in the Emperor is quite strong as a character. Like, he's very... He doesn't spout, like, religious stuff. But he's very much, like, in his own mind, he's, like, saying, you know, for the Emperor c- continuously. He's a one-armed, like, old dude that keeps, he's thumping in, like, little sort of 
hooks and he managed to climb his way to the top after who knows how long and gets to the top and then Gaskell's there and just kicks him back down again. <laughs> We're just like, oh my God. Ugh. So eventually he has to do it again and he makes it to the top and he kind of, Gaskell's not there, but he realizes that like, he thinks he's been watched the entire time and he manages to kill the orcs like that are at this like guarding pose. And he steps through like a next door and he gets captured immediately because he realizes Gaskell's been watching him the entire time. He's trying to learn from him. And he gets thrown into a different prison area this time. And he is actually thrown in prison with humans. And these humans are actually the somewhat, they're like the survivors of the force who were on Golgotha. They're basically made into slaves to essentially harvest metal for orcs whenever they want it. At times, like, Gazgul, like, kind of sort of like a little creepy guy in the shadow goes, like, I'm watching you. I swear I'm here. And he's just slowly, like, it's, I don't know how, like, an orc that big can be stealthy, but for some reason, like, he sneaks up on them a lot. If the Raven God can do it in full plate armor, then an orc can do it. Why not? <laughs> it is bizarre, but... Clearly size has nothing to do with how sneaky you can be in this setting. <laughs> yeah, very much. It's, it's pretty bizarre, and, um... But he doesn't see Gazgul for a while. And Yarek does what he does best. And he starts to fight back. So he's sort of... The prisoners... They all kind of know him. But in a way, this is not like the Yarek they know. Because he's just like he doesn't have his power. He's not being the iconic thing he usually is. But he's like, we're still going to fight back. So they create, this, they create a complicated plan to sort of break out. And this plan is as brutal and as grueling as basically all of his story has been so far. Where essentially people... Like, they have to, like, smash open Promethean tanks, like, set themselves and the orcs on fire as a sacrifice so some of the others can get away. It's like, they're like, cry. Like, like they literally, like, are humans as well. Like, regular old humans trying to kill, like, the orcs, <laughs> like, around them. So, like, it takes a few of them to, like, batter them down and most of them get, like, stomped. But Yarrick and a, like, crack team sort of manage to get out. And they slowly make their way through the Space Hulk. At many times, they're realizing they're not here to actually leave. They just want to cause as much damage to the orcs as possible. And one by one, like each of the crew, like he gets to know, um, they all sort of sacrifice themselves as like distractions. So they go into like crazy like battles. They're not going to win, but they do sort of. They're doing it to buy time to get closer into the <clears throat> inner sanctums. And eventually. Uh, it's only Yarrick and one other guy left. And this, I think his name is, it's not, maybe it's Benedin or Benjin, something like that. This guy had previously been like a rat in a way. Like he used to be one of the slaves in charge of the other slaves. And everyone used to hate him because they thought he would basically kill the slaves who were like slacking. And everyone was like, oh, you're a traitor, scum. And suddenly when Yarrick realizes like he actually has been doing it because he's ending people's suffering. So like he would whisper like for the emperor as he were doing it. So they kind of become close towards the end. And as they're getting closer and closer to this inner sanctum, they get to this like weird elevator scene where they're like, oh, we made it. And they start to hear the orcs behind them. They realize like, oh crap, they knew <laughs> like, the entire time. And they basically start running up these, uh, this like staircase thing, whilst an elevator next to them is like going up slowly and they have to like throw grenades behind them. They have like crude orc weapons. They make it to the top and then they're like ambushed. So they throw all their grenades. They blow up the entire area, which eventually leads to like the, them almost falling down into the um, like this gnawing pit, like fire. And Yarrick is kind of almost off the edge. Like the guy is like holding him up. The only last guy who's alive. And um, Yarrick is like, I'm only a one armed old dude. Like, I don't think I can hold on. And the other guy says, You actually got to. You're, it's more important that you live so he like latches in on and lets himself fall instead rather than because the, the beam they're holding on is not going to support both their weights so like literally everyone has like died to get Yarrick here and at this point he is literally like a disheveled old literally you never know david letterman right he's like david letterman once he stopped hosting the david letterman show <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he looks like that and he makes his way to the control room and you he, he can hear the orc like pounding to try and get in. And he just says, I'm just going to do as much damage as possible. So he literally flicks on every single 
control everything and the entire space hulk obviously filled with lots of different ships it starts to like shift and all the ships are, like being powered on they start to, like sh the whole thing shakes so but loads of like obviously the slaves in it die but loads of orcs die in it too and eventually the orcs break in and everything starts to explode and the Eric starts to fall back into that pit they saw earlier because like an explosion pushes him back that way and he's thinking oh yes finally my death is coming i can say my service is ended and he realizes like uh -uh. <laughs> a massive orc is running forward and it's like and it's gazkul who's run forward and grabbed him and he's like no <laughs> and he's been saved and then he kind of awakens like confused like how am i alive and he realizes his power claw has been reattached and his bail eye has been reattached and his uniform is on again and then it's like and kind they've of pressed orc. it and everything. They've ironed his shirt yeah. and they've made it all nice. <laughs> and all the orcs are like kind of, you know, like fixing his equipment. And he sits up and he's like, hmm. And then he's like grinning with that like kind of old man, you know, like a hateful stare. And he leaves the door. It's a really funny bit where he says like he actually realizes how like effing bizarre this is where all the orcs are lined up. And he says, like, he's been to many military parades and he would never not stroll down a military parade. <laughs> so he walks down and he sees Gazkul there. And Gazkul is the way he talks to him and says, like, but, you know, he sort of tells him in his way, like, you know, in high Gothic, by the way, Gazkul speaks in high Gothic, which is obviously um, the much more... In, in uh, Warhammer, there's low Gothic, which is spoken by most of the Imperium. And there's high gothic, which is often used in administration or yeah. I think it's described that like low gothic is English, high gothic is more like Latin. If that's yeah, correct. and Gaskell speaks in it's high cool. gothic to him. It's really bizarre. Guys, okay, good. Oh, so I think uh, I've read before like high gothic is the fake Latin they use, uh, but low gothic is like just everything, like every language ever. And it's oh. they're just classified as different dialects of low gothic, like Spanish, English, French, Russian, any anything you can think of. That's all low gothic, just different dialects. And uh, Gazkul basically says to him, "Listen, you put up a good fight, and orcs, we know as orcs, we love that, so we're going to let you go." And then obviously, Yarek like kind of puts it together that he's actually. He's been observing, like I said, like he's been observing and learning from him. He's only, he basically knew what Yarek's going to do the entire time because he's kind of wanted to learn about how Yarek and humans operate. So that's like even more terrifying to uh, Yarek. But obviously, he gets to leave. And as much as Gazkul's last words, he says, uh, prepare for a big old fight. And that big old fight does come, but a few decades later, for some reason, it's, like, it's not straight away. But a few decades later, Armageddon would once again be invaded uh, by orcs. For some reason, that planet just can't get a break. And um, the Third War of Armageddon begins with, they call him the... Uh, Yarek, by this time, is an ancient figure. He literally looks as old as he probably feels. He's probably like hundreds of centuries of years old in his in a core but if even the rejuvenants are still not working anymore because like he, yeah that's how he's old older he than most astartes at this point he's he's i think he's older than some even chapter masters like mm. who come to this so the third war of armageddon is different this time because they're prepared and many different space marine chapters arrive uh flesh terrors gabriel seth uh, black templars Hellbrecht. i had an art piece made for that that was a very cool one i, I enjoyed that and um essentially to show how much people respect and have learned from Yarrick, Yarrick is in Yarrick doesn't actually hold any official position other than a, just a normal commissar, but he is invited to this meeting and in fact he helms it. There's even a funny part where one of the other space marines, who by the way is he specifies he's in orange armor, you clearly know it's not one of them anything main or like anyone plays because no one ever paints their mains in orange doesn't grimaldus even mention like oh he's from some like backward chapter that no one gives a shit about like, oh pretty grimaldus. much yeah <laughs> good old uh grimaldus is there too and they essentially listen to yarrick because yarrick knows what he's doing and how he orcs think and like it's described how like even the chapter masters defer to his um command on this which obviously is showing how much even space marines are looking up to a normal human being and 
the third war of Armageddon is begin a uh, beginning. Sorry, uh, Yarek immediately says we have to abandon Hades Hive, and everyone's like, "What? The- Why would you do that?" And it's like because he knows Yarek. Well, he knows Gazkul. He knows how he thinks. He knows he's going to destroy it as a symbol because that's what he would do. Because obviously they're both in a way symbols, and symbols need to be killed to kill the enemy. And the war begins with basically Gazkul and. Whereas previously there was perhaps one moon that attacked sec- the second of Armageddon, now multiple moons of orcs like and meteors land into Armageddon. The amount of guard and imperial regiment and space marines and munitions and firepower is so enormous and in its millions that it literally blots out the sky in terms of when they fire at these um massive meteors yeah uh yarek has to fight they fight this war for many years but there's even a short story where yarek actually gets uh, attacked in his bane blade funny they went back to golgotha they grabbed his destroyed bane blade remade it only to then be now again on armageddon it will be attacked in it and almost he would almost be killed but then he's actually saved by the black dragons chapter which is very bizarre because they don't really show up much surprisingly they show up in a short story with Sethano, who we obviously spoke about before she's not here for the third war of armageddon and this convict is just as big or much larger than the second one obviously there's main notable things i don't want to quite cover so we might say it for another episode such as the defense of um what's the one with grimaldus it's hell's uh, reach hell's reach hide hell's reach which again is his own kind of story there's very there's a lot of legendary fights. This war lasts for a few years, but eventually, uh, Gazkul, as much as we say he's repelled, I think he just got bored because I think the same thing happened again. We got bogged uh, down. Doesn't he get a vision from the prophets? Uh, as the prophet, he gets yes. a vision from Gork and Mork. He's like, oh, something yeah, more important is happening. I've got to go now. I need to die this was a good test right for what I'm actually name. planning to do. <laughs> he needed to go, and Gazkul would leave Armageddon. And again, Yarek's offered retirement and he just can't take it for some reason. He's so old and ancient, he just can't give up. And him and um, Helbrecht, the master of chapter master of the Black Templars, uh, give they give chase to uh, Gazkul. They actually do have a small conflict in space, but they get very close to sort of getting to Gazkul. But again, they fail. And this is one of the few times where um, Yarek does feel quite a lot of despair like he's just come so close again to not be able to destroy his arch rival because in a way Gaskell doesn't want Yarek to die but Yarek really wants uh Gaskell to die he's he's lived a life of long war and he's very much a bitter old man even though he's the hero of the Imperium and he's done what he needs what has needed to be done in a way he still acts the role as what the Imperium demands of him but he's obviously very tired but speaking of that uh supposedly unfortunately is slightly off screen here uh we're not quite sure if it is i would say we said earlier it was angron that killed him but i don't think it's quite confirmed how yarrick does die i think we all thought it might be angron um due to the angron book primark book coming out but yarrick's death has somewhat been said like he's died and they've told the bells on terror for a hero of the Imperium. There's like an image of kind of his corpse slash with the bale eye and the commissar hat. I really hope there's a book about actually how he dies and I hope they maybe give it to Gazkul. Because I think it's part of Gazkul's story in a way more. But it'd be cool to see that kind of rivalry end. Obviously, you know, in a way, uh, Yarrick has always fought orcs even like for instance he was a, literally a boy hiding from them you know with his, his old sarge to then actually having to fight them so many times in armageddon and then uh yeah he's, he's yarek has been through a lot but he's he's got tenacity I, it's hard to explain well just in the books as how much his intelligence comes through he's not a he's ruthless in the sense that he's willing to make the hard decision he doesn't enjoy doing it but he does it without a second thought because he just knows ultimately that will save more people in the end as much as he obviously in a way by our today's standards yarek would have killed more people than anyone in our planet combined so <laughs> um but obviously it's not him doing that in a way like other 
things have forced those decisions upon him. But Yarrick has done a lot. He's literally many times whenever he fights, he literally goes beyond the point of exhaustion. In he's not the greatest fighter ever. You know, he's not. He's okay. But he always. But you can use a all. storm bolter somehow. <laughs> yes, yeah, somehow. Um, he's just that ripped. Yeah, I know there's theories about people like the orcs imbue him with strength because they their belief empowers him, and that's how he can just fire a storm bolter that like a space marine yeah. could use. But it's like, it's, nah, it's fine with my weak arthritic wrists. It's no damage. It's, it's <laughs> the same reason Rambo can one arm an M60. It's because it's cool <laughs> and it's great. Stop thinking about it. Yeah. Mm. I hope uh, there's a bit of a, um, a law dump for uh, people there, unfortunately. There's quite a, there's a few things I did miss out, uh, unfortunately, with Yarrick. But again, that's just, that level of detail is, again, as I've done, three hours long. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's a ridiculous amount. Um, but that's kind of the current law of Yarrick. Hopefully we get his end sometime mm. soon. Obviously, um, as we mentioned to people earlier, this is obviously coming out near Halloweenish time, so and also October as well. Orcs, 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 orcs. Um, <laughs> so there's a, obviously a, quite a bit of orc heavy on this one, um, and I hope uh, <laughs> hope people didn't get too overwhelmed with the massive amount of like. So then it was just getting worse. Um, but that's kind of the overarching story of Yarrick. Uh, what do you guys nice. think so far, Colin? What do you think? <laughs> Uh, I think he's very cool, and I do need to read the books he's in. Uh, but that being said, even I know you're a big fan of him, and you did a great oh. job of telling us about Yarrick, but I don't think he's going to supplant Caiaphas I, Kane. I, I, I think Ka- Kane's more lovable, Take, isn't Kane, he? Kane is a Colin character. So. Yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> I think Kane's a lot more lovable, whereas Yarrick is, I think he he plays into what he's meant to be. Like He's more than a human, in a way. He's not. He's not as relatable. In his own mind, he is like you see his own struggles, but then, I, yeah, go say. I, I, I would take Yarrick if I needed someone to lead me through a Hell. grand field of war. <laughs> I would take Kane on a moment to moment basis because he would mm-hmm. BS our way to. Well, <laughs> I think there's an interesting dynamic between like Gaunt, Kane, and uh, Yarrick, where it's like Gaunt is the human version of a commissar. Yarrick is the legend of a commissar, and then Kane is want to be like, a commissar. He's like, a, like, oh, it's your your buddy who happens to be a commissar. Like, what? Ha, yeah, how are you Kane a commissar? What's advice. going on here? The jester here. <laughs> yeah. you know? Kane's the idiot in the workplace who should not. <laughs> he's like, who shouldn't be a commissar? Yeah, here he is, and he's he's failing he's successfully. So What's job, going though? on? <laughs> he is quite. He's, he failed successfully. That's like the kind of thing, isn't it? <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's quite a big. I mean, Yarrick does do, is pretty much, there's a little bit of like chaos stuff interwoven, but it's very orc heavy. Um, Eli, what do you think of the uh, old Balai himself? I didn't know a lot of that lore, so that was cool. I only knew his childhood and Armageddon. I didn't know all that stuff in between, so. I would recommend the, the, I I really don't do it justice, but his first two books, which are the ones on Mistral and the Second War of Armageddon, damn, the scenery and the way they describe like particularly the way they describe the mm-hmm. orcs in that book is you, ne- you never felt so small it was like a lot of it if you're a space marine if it's like a space marine story you don't really feel overwhelmed it's kind of like a it's always a you know ragtag group coming through whereas mm-hmm. this is like oh we we're actually throwing people at a <laughs> hole trying to fill it we are throwing bits of yeah. people still clutching grenades yeah. just so they were like, go away, go away. <laughs> oh, the, the death of the hive cities in the book is so horrific. <laughs> it's like even, I didn't even describe, like there's a bit where most of the hive cities, most people didn't get out of the hive city. So a lot of the orc forces are trapped in there just going door to door, like basically mm-hmm. taking does, the people. Does it do a, a good job of, I know a lot of people can get frustrated with how the law either says orcs are goofy goofballs or they are the most horrifying <laughs> thing in the setting and it's like. Both. It does both yeah. well because obviously there's that orc that waves and then there's, yeah. there's like, he's like, hi guys. Like he's like nervous and it's first day <laughs> God of school. the gormless we'll call him, yeah. <laughs> and then there's also like, oh this is what it means to actually fight orcs in a, yeah. in a just, human it's sense. It's just the perspective. Yeah, you just have to look yeah. at it through the right perspective. If you look through your faction's perspective, they're always the good guys. That's like that's mm. all you have to remember. And from everyone else's perspective, though, they're not the good guys, and they're unless you're the Drukar, and you're like, we're definitely not horrible. the good guys, but we're having oh, yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> we don't care. 
You just got. It depends on if you want to get your Warhammer lore from, you know, books and stuff, or if you just look at memes and then you'll. There's a clear. Yeah, you you can tell. <laughs> Yarrick memes well as like there's good memes and there's mm-hmm. good lore for the character, so it's, it's a nice balance. Uh, uh, what did you uh, think, Andy? By the way, the only thing I'll mention is I'm hoping that he's not dead and actually it's all a ruse and that he's trying to <laughs> pretend that he's dead so that Gazgul goes a bit mental and it's all a ploy so that he can mm. catch him off guard and go, I'm not dead yet, you think he's some actually chaos serious. demons will get me, you idiot, I'm the bay <laughs> <laughs> I said that just to make you mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much implied, uh, by the way, I didn't... It's, there's a few <laughs> nods in the Chains of Golgotha book, which is the one where he's... um the prisoner on the space hole, which is basically he's essentially Rambo in that book. <laughs> very much implied in that. Although I would say... Well, oh, go, sorry? Well, it's, you could, might just be a saint too. He might get resurrected and, you know, do all the oh. sainty stuff. But He, he deserves a not. I think Yarrick's as a character, I've read, I read literally everything he's uh, <laughs> been in. I think he's kind of... As much as people are like, oh, I'm sad he's dead. Like, some Warhammer characters they need to have their arc finished rather than yeah. like you know that it's probably like you know Khan the Betrayer where it's like he's had his full full he dies all full, the time full to the... chaos and then he's just kind of this amorphic angry thing now sometimes yeah. a character I think it's Yarrick dying would be okay because first of all there's a lot to you could replace him with or in a way his story has an it could have a nice ending with dying at Gazgul. Like the arc is yeah. complete. Yeah, he has to be killed by Gazgul or I'm not gonna be happy. <laughs> a lot a lot of time um GW are not brave enough to kill a character. Yeah. So I feel like it'd be a good opportunity like to Yeah, you know, Yarak did his cool stuff. He did it. He's like, he's he's one he's let him, let him I, have his I just want Gazgul to go to his funeral and go, Oh, I'm <laughs> so sad. Only for hit, ga- only for Yarrick's hand to lunge out of the coffin, grab <laughs> Gazgul by the neck, yeah. pull him in and like You're go, coming with me. You're coming with and then he just oh, reveals yeah. Melter Charge or something because <laughs> like that would be a cool and then Gazgul nice. maybe survives but is really badly wounded. But it's like that was a good way to go. Good. Mm-hmm. Well Not- Ragnar beheaded him, right? <laughs> yeah, he cut his head <laughs> off and then he was like, oh, he he issue, new body, bigger body, lol. Which is weird, isn't it? They let him have like a bigger. Supposedly, he's an enormous, enormous orc, but there, there was a bigger orc where he could have his head. Yeah, in. there was like one that was just. Like, <laughs> we've been feeding him nothing but protein shakes for twenty years, nonstop, and he's gigantic oh, now. That yeah. was the spare from that exact situation. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys so much for listening. Obviously, there's a bit of a big law dump on Yarrick, but he definitely deserves uh, some love. <laughs> Uh, we hope you guys obviously like the orc stuff too. Um, I think this is this definitely is one of the <coughs> in the books the better portrayal of orcs. Or they're quite terrifying. I think there is a is it brutal cunning is a good book on orcs. Maybe we should. Uh, we I, might I quite read. like Rin's world how they were like these are not goofy goofballs. They are really nasty. Like when they're well, they, they're the goofy orcs to holding each other. the guy on the on yeah. the fire and he's burning him from the toes up yeah, like, oh, that's, yeah that's hilarious to an orc like yeah, it's, yeah it's but like, it's in a yeah, perverse Joker way you're like oh yeah. no yeah, <laughs> yeah well I, um, I hope uh, people enjoyed that rend- <laughs> absolute lashing and rend- rendition and uh, <laughs> again like any topics you want us to cover please do comment them below because they're very much we've obviously listened to what you say you want to cover the things you want to hear just don't and talk about Elder. <laughs> no. Hey, hey! No, dude. we'll get a Phoenix Lords <laughs> episode someday. We haven't, we haven't had an Eldar or Phoenix Lord one yet, so we should probably. Oh, gonna rise, Carbon. It's Carbon. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, with that being said, thank you guys, and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Bye. Love you.